Performance Anxiety on the Pantheon Podcast Network, and I'm your host, Mark, and today's guest makes me feel like royalty. It's drummer Michael Bland, and he's worked with some of the best in the business, the music business, that is. But before all that, he played in school and found out he had perfect pitch. Finding that out helped solidify his decision to be a musician. But his parents weren't exactly thrilled about the idea and pushed him to have a backup plan. That is, until Prince called the house looking for Michael. This started a trend of Michael being offered jobs on stage in the middle of jams. He was a drummer for the new power generation during a time where Prince was reinventing himself. But Prince isn't the only high-profile artist Michael has worked with. There's Paul Westerberg, Shaka Khan, Maxwell, Nick Jonas, Soul Asylum. Michael relays some of the -the behind-the-scenes stories about Prince, Paisley Park, and the Paisley Park Power Trio, among other things. And that ties into his new project he's working on with longtime collaborator Sonny Thompson called Brothers. They have a single coming out and are playing a show with a lot of the new power generation. Check Michael out at Michael Bland Official and at Brothers Music 2024 on Instagram. Check out Brothers for Life on Facebook. And look for Soul Asylum on tour this summer with Our Lady Peace, Live, and Stone Temple Pilots. That's going to be an amazing show. Look for us at Performance ANX on socials. Love us with the gift of coffee at ko-fi slash performance anxiety. Or buy something with our logo at performanceanx.threadless.com. And I had a wonderful time talking with Michael Bland on performance anxiety on the Pantheon Podcast Network. Check it out. Okay, well, this is Michael Bland, one half of the duo Brothers, and um, I'm on podcast with Performance Anxiety. Mark, great guy, got a lot on the bean, you know, generous, kind, everything. Mark is everything, y'all. Performance Anxiety is on the one. All right. Uh, the way I usually like to start is from the the very very beginning. You, obviously, you're a musician. Most of my guests on the podcast are musicians, but I like to find out what got you started in music in the first place. So you're born in Minneapolis. Uh, you still live there, in fact, right? Yeah, I live in Minnesota. I live uh, in Eden Prairie, which is uh, when I went to, the, while I was working for Prince, I moved closer to to Chanhassen because. The commute was crazy. Ah, yeah, that commute so, to Prince's place is insane. So I'm, yeah, I, I lived in, like, <laughs> southeast Minneapolis, like Dinky okay. Town. And so, you know, from there, it was an hour easy. But now I live still, like, 13 minutes up the road. Oh, okay, okay. You're a drummer. Is, is that what you started playing with drums, or was there something else that, that got you playing? No, nah, I went through piano and, and baritone horn before I got to the, the drums. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> How old were you when you started playing those? Oh, well, there was a piano in the house. It was beat up and never tuned. <laughs> <laughs> and somehow I still genetically got charged up with perfect pitch. I don't know why. I was about to ask you that. I've heard that you have it. Is that, does that drive you nuts to play a piano when, at the side of tune when you have perfect pitch? No, I guess because I kind of grew up with it. It oh. didn't, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'll tell you what did drive me crazy. was like flutophone, you know, <laughs> uh, ensemble in elementary school. Oh. Then it really, I was like, wow. Like, <laughs> That did a number on me. What got you into music in the first place? I mean, was there a lot of it in the house? Were your parents playing a lot of it? Yeah, all of that. I mean, I have three older sisters and, you know, my mom and dad. So, I mean, everybody kind of had their own taste. And I I sort of, uh, right from the get-go, knew what I wanted out of music. My sisters used to tell me that before before I could read, I could tell the difference between, they would hold up two Motown 45s. You know, and they all looked alike, you yeah. know, the purple with the silver with the, you know, with the star for where uh, Detroit was. Right, right. And they'd say, you want to listen to this one or this one? And it'd be like ABC by the Jackson 5 and like Superstition by Stevie Wonder. And it's like, I think I always, I think they said I always picked Superstition <laughs> and nobody knew how. Like it just, <laughs> that was the one, ah, that one, put that one on. Wow. So, oh, that's awesome. I, that's amazing. 
Yeah, I mean, it was somewhat of a musical family. My father was a, a musician in church. Okay. And my youngest older sister still plays in church uh, here in town. So, I mean, it was a part of the family, but I mean, it really, I, I caught the bug the worst. And I don't know if it's a, has a matter to do, has more to do with my, uh, the priorities that were present in me, whether that be spiritually or mentally or whatever. But I, it's just like, once music got a hold of me, <laughs> I couldn't really, it was like, I mean, but it took a while. I mean, I had proper drum lessons and whatnot. Okay. And I even went to lessons for piano, even though my father, my father taught, he wanted somebody else to, to teach me. So you, your dad taught piano? He, well, he happened to. Oh, okay. He taught piano pretty much so that my sister, my youngest older sister, Carla, could, you know, sub for him if he needed to be some, or somewhere else. I, mean, okay. I think it might have been more of a matter of convenience right. than anything else. But she's got a great ear and the, the instincts for the instrument. But, you know, my ear was so strong that I wasn't even really reading. Uh, the you know and when you're a little kid they go okay now you play it now okay now Tommy you play it yeah you know yeah. and I would hear what the the person in front of me was playing and I mm, and just kind of yeah you know wow mimic it. that's crazy so, yeah so I wasn't really learning anything <laughs> <laughs> you know? I was just kind of like oh mm -hmm, okay it goes like that yeah so it it wasn't until I got to be about fourteen when I was like, wow, this is it for me. And my, you know, the slow decline of my grades yeah. and, you know, the strange behaviors and, you know, yeah. staying up all night listening to the radio and all of that, you know? Oh yeah. Now, are, By are you, 14, it was, I was done. It like, was so the, was the decision life. had been made. Yeah. Now, are you the only professional musician in the family? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, all right. So you talked about playing at 14. So, right around the time you started going into high school and then two years after high school, you're playing with Prince. So uh, three, three, okay. kind of, well, I mean, let's see, uh, let me give you a little bit of backstory. Yeah. Because, I mean, really it's, you know, I went from being like a, a singular musician looking for other people to, co to collaborate with, uh, you know, to meeting this dude up the street named his name was uh, Nathan Pate, Nate okay. Pate, Nate Pate, and he was this multi instrumentalist who happened to be riding on the school bus. And one day we start talking, you know, and he played guitar, he played trombone, he played baritone horn, he played, I think he played French horn also and trumpet. Like he was this sort of musical prodigy who had wow. been in um, the Minnesota Youth Symphony since he was probably eight years old. Oh wow. And he just happened to be, you know, in this phase where he was learning guitar. And one morning, what was it? I think Eruption came on KQ92, like Van Halen 1 came out. Right. And he was listening to KQ that morning, too. He's like, did you hear? You know, there's this, there's this guitar player. That's in, and he quickly figured out the hammer on technique. And we were playing all sorts of wow. Van Halen in my parents' basement <laughs> and Led Zeppelin and you know, Hendrix, all of that, you know? Yeah. So he was a real catalyst. Like he really, I finally had somebody to share ideas with that went on until I joined like wind ensemble in high school. And there things started to really open up. I started to meet you know, other like-minded individuals and uh, other drummers. And, you know, it's, you know, you find your place in high school. And mine was just in the music room. And Dr. Denny Malmberg was uh, the band director for Wind Ensemble. And he took a shine to me because he recognized some sort of aptitude. And uh, he was actually the first person to tell me I had perfect pitch. I just thought, you know, some other musicians were either not uh, really applying themselves right. or not listening well enough. But he was like. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. Before you skip over this ad, give me one minute. Like most podcasts, I pick sponsors carefully and I use the products that advertise here. Pure Spectrum CBD is a product that has been really beneficial for me. They have a wide variety of great products that can be used on a daily or as needed basis. I've been using the tincture every day and it's been wonderful for easing anxiety. 
and I absolutely love the isolate. I use it instead of acetaminophen or ibuprofen, and it's worked so well for the relief of aches and pains. They also have soaks, lotions, salves, gummies, and more, plus an entire line for fitness recovery. They even have products for your pets. See everything they offer at PureSpectrumCBD.com. And if you have questions, they're there to help. They helped me when I had no idea where to start. After you fill your cart, use code PERFORMANCEANX for 15% off your purchase. Pure Spectrum CBD, Pure Spectrum CBD, Pure Spectrum CBD. One day, what happened? Somebody, he asked somebody, to play, oh, play it. Roger, play a concert B-flat, the, the string bass player in Wind Ensemble. And he played like a C instead. I was like, that's not B-flat, that's C. And he looked up like, <laughs> you're a drummer. You're not supposed to know what <laughs> notes anybody's playing. And so then he goes, huh, all right. And then he leans over to like one of the clarinet players and, and tells her to do you play know, it. And she plays a note and I tell him what it is. And then he leans over to the flutes and he, you know, does the same thing. Wow. His class, Mr. Bland is in, you know, the, you know, the rare, uh, he like knew the percentage of people in the world who had perfect pitch and everything. Oh my gosh. So then he tested my ears against the strobe tuner. And then he started like leaning over and saying, okay, play B flat, but pull out, you know? So, you know, then it was like flat or sharp. And it, like, he just kind of ran the whole drill. Oh my it was gosh. Like, like, do you know how rare that is? Mr. Bland? I'm like, I didn't even know I had it. <laughs> <laughs> it's so rare. I didn't even know. Right. Yes. So, I mean, that enlightened me, you know, more and entrenched me in my purpose. Like uh, to know that I was imbued with a certain gift for music. Yeah. Just made it even more like, well, this is it. It kind of cemented everything for you. It made me, it gave me the confidence to say I could do this. Even though my father was like, you're, you're bringing home D's and F's. My father actually, his vocation was as an educator. He was a science teacher. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, and, and he played music in church, but that was not his vocation. Of course, when my grades started to slip, he, he blew a gasket. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, it literally took the day that Prince called the house. Like he picked up the phone and Prince is on the other end of the phone oh my God. <laughs> for him to finally go, okay, well maybe, he, maybe this is really what he's supposed to be doing. Wow. You know? So until right. then it was just like, you're doing what feels good. Do you know the percentage of people who make it in the music business? Almost none. You, it's almost like being an athlete. Say you, something happens to you. Say you, you know, you, you get in a car accident and you're paralyzed from the neck down. Yeah. You won't be able to do anything because your mind will be empty. Oh, <laughs> wow. You know, more or less. Yeah. I mean, I'm exaggerating for effect, but friends of mine met my dad and he was, he intimidated every one of my friends that came in the house because he looked at him like, oh, great. Another person coming in here, <laughs> filling my boy's head with ideas of, you know, Delusions of grandeur about making it in the music business. Right. Until, like, may I speak to Michael, please? And my dad <laughs> went to the phone like, I think it's Prince. Oh, my <laughs> so, God. So now there we are. I just wanted to get you there. So between your buddies on the bus and Prince, were you playing in bands? You know, were you play gigging at all in the uh, in your Absolutely. Own bands? Yes. I, I mean, I, I, uh, well, I won... A contest that a store put on. There was, used to be a, a music store in Minneapolis called Newt Coupe. And actually, the guy that uh, created the cloud guitar for Prince, or the guy who built the first one, yeah. I think may have been uh, an employee at, at Newt Coupe. Oh, wow. I'm not, don't quote me on that, but I seem to remember somebody saying that. Okay. Okay. But they were like the the like the head honcho. This is before Guitar Center and all that. Oh, okay. Right. It, this was the place to go. Bongo Johnny, John Haga, who uh, I've, I'm still friends with to this day, was the, what do they call it? Like he ran the drum department. Okay. And I'd come down there, you know, I was 16, coming downstairs into the <laughs> drum department. Hey. You play on that old kid over here. Leave those new drums alone. Because every time you start, you know, so <laughs> we, we were fast friends. New Cape has a Twin Cities Best Drummer Contest in 1986. I just kind of, you know, go up on stage and I win first place. Oh, my gosh. You know? 
Right. It's just in front of every good drummer, you know, in the entire state wow. is there. Like, who's going to take the crown? Right. You know? Oh, my God. And um, one of the judges was a guy named Bobby Vandell. And Bobby Vandell had played with Alexander O'Neill, the Jets. He was a he was and is a, 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 a he's a local legend and otherwise. Bobby Vandell, his word is gold everywhere in the world. Right. <laughs> He uh, he's presently a uh, he DJ's on the local jazz station. I think it's KBEM. He's on, but um, Bobby Bobby really was the one who got me from this sort of life of just going back and forth and looking for people to play with directly to to his band, which was a group called Doctor Mambo's Combo. And at okay. some point, yes, I started subbing for Bobby. I I, I became his main subbing drummer. I played with Paul Metza. I played with Lamont Cranston. The oh, Lamont wow. Cranston band. Yeah. I played. Yeah. It's like all of Bobby's gigs when he'd leave town, he's like, Hey, you got to cover this for me, man. You know? So I go from sitting in with the combo, you know, here and there to all of a sudden I'd be playing six nights a week covering his local gigs when he was out of town. He eventually moved to Los Angeles. And so I kind of took over the duties. Oh my gosh. But Bobby Bobby's the one who brought me into the combo. And from there is where I met Prince at Bunker's Music Bar and Grill downtown oh. in. Oh, okay. And okay. that yes, we met in nineteen nineteen, I think I want to say it was late nineteen eighty eight. But it yes, it was late nineteen eighty eight. And Prince just kind of came down to Bunkers and he took a shine to the band. He started sitting in and he, he, you know, he liked to have parties at Paisley Park even back then. And um, one particular night, he sends his security down to Bunkers and says, "Hey, Prince is throwing a party for Bon Jovi later on tonight." You know, uh, <laughs> who was playing at the Target Center, I think, that night. Right. <laughs> and he want he wants you guys to come. So we caravan out to Paisley Park at like two o'clock in the morning. We get there probably around three, and you know, we were pretty relaxed about getting there. But but when I show up. It's like the the dude who greets me at the door is like, where you been, man? Prince has been looking for you. Like, why is he looking for me? What? <laughs> he takes me directly to Prince. Prince is like, how was the set tonight? I'm like, it was all right, man. Hey, you, you, you got any energy left? You feel like jamming? Yeah, man, let's do it. So we walk out to the soundstage and Living Color is in the middle of playing like Black Magic Woman. Like oh, this, my God. Like this... It's like it was like fusion. I mean, it was crazy what they were doing. Prince walks in, kicks them off the. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, like yeah, all right, gangway. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah. oh my god, I love Living Color. I would have killed to see that. Yeah, so he's you know he, uh, he I mean he wasn't rude about it, just, right? You know, just, still like, though, like but he was waiting for us to show up, and particularly me. I, I didn't know this at this time. So we get on and we start, you know, just kind of funking, you know, uh, I think we were just kind of grooving and he was kind of taking it towards like parliament funkadelic, like gaming on you okay. and like bop gun and all that. And all of a sudden he leans up, he was playing keys and like the rest of us were just jamming with him. And he, he, I saw him look at me and he said, Hey son, you're looking for a job. You're looking for a job, son. <laughs> and I'm looking like, is he talking to me? Like, in the middle of a uh, yeah, song. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm looking for a job. Yeah. I mean, he must be saying, I sound pretty good to him right now. That's hey, that's 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 really great, man. He was serious. Wow. <laughs> right? <laughs> so this sort of courtship begins, and then I get properly asked to, to join the band. By then, I'm I'm in my second year of college, actually. Okay. So a sophomore. When Prince calls the house, can I speak to Michael, please? Oh, and God. I'm still like, I don't really understand the magnitude of, of the situation at all. Right. I've never seen a Prince concert. I know that he's a famous person, but if you've never gone really outside of Minnesota, you don't, you don't have any sense of proportion. Right. So to me, he's like this cool kind of quirky dude who lived in Minneapolis, you know, who I, you know, I was like, Oh, I saw purple rain. It's like, okay. I just didn't have, you know, I wasn't a, a fan fan. Right. You know, like I knew he existed. I'd heard some of his music, you know, and some of it I found a little sacrilegious and a little like I didn't know how to take some of it. If I'm, I'm going to be a 100% honest. Oh, yeah, yeah. That, that's know? understandable. But um, so he 
he asks, like, you know, I'd like for you to join my band. I'm working on, I'm finishing a, a, the Batman soundtrack. It's a soundtrack for this, this new record that's coming out, or this uh, new movie that's coming out. And, um, you know, so I, I have, I'm making a lot of plans, and I'd like you to be a part of my, my new group. And I think I asked him, I said, well, I mean, uh, and this is probably May, late May or June. I think I was out of school for the summer. Okay. And I asked him something about like, well, do you think I might be able to squeeze in another semester, you know, in the fall, you know, <laughs> and, and that's what he, he just laughed at. Me. <laughs> he said, I think you're going to probably be too busy for that. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Oh, well, Okay. And, um, oh my God. <laughs> yeah, I had no idea what I was getting into. Oh yeah. It sounds like, but holy crow. Oh, I can't even imagine that. Right. So after that, we shoot the video for party man, which is, you know, gets played on MTV and everywhere. And it's yeah. like, Whoa, dude, <laughs> like you're in Prince's band now. You know, a lot of that. <laughs> and then that fall we played the season premiere of Saturday Night Live. It was the 15 year anniversary. Oh, okay. Cool. And we played a song called Electric Chair, also on the Batman soundtrack. I saw your friend first. That's who I dance with. On the time I was watching you. The music rocked us. Our eyes like dust. Making us see a trippy picture shoot. And from there, it it's pretty much it was all sort of cemented. We went on tour in uh, summer of spring of ninety, uh, the nude tour. It was a, a very stripped down sort of you know it was kind of like a tour for the Batman record, but it was really kind of a greatest hits tour because Love Sexy had been the tour before that. And it, I think right, it didn't do right. so well. It, you know, that, that whole period sort of alienated people who were who maybe offended by matters of the spirit or, you know, even just the fact that he was just kind of naked on the cover mm -hmm. was enough for certain people to be, you know, repelled. Yeah. So he was in a real interesting phase right before that. I, so I, think yeah. he was, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So he was kind of, it, things were... Developing, you know, Rosie joined the band, Tony Damon and Kirk, the, uh, the the Game Boys, they called them then. They all joined. So it was kind of, it was half and half, like new players, old players. Fink was still there. Miko Weaver was on guitar. Levi was on bass. But then it was me, Rosie, and Tony Damon and Kirk. So it was, you know, it was one big happy, you know, but it was kind of a transitional tour because after that, then Miko left, Levi moved to guitar. Sonny came in on bass and Tommy replaced Fink. Okay. And that's how the new power generation got put together. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. All right. So you're this young kid on drums. Mm -hmm. And as far as the history of Prince, I don't know tons, but I have heard, that's all right. I have heard <laughs> that his live shows go all over the place. They can play some new stuff, some old stuff, and, and it could just change on a whim based on what he wants to play at that moment. As, oh, yeah. As the drummer, did you have to go back and learn a whole bunch of old songs, or is it more of like, a, okay, I know this. it's going to be this type of beat? How, how did that work for you being so young? No, I, I definitely, I, I was young, but I, I had a, a certain amount of conventional wisdom. Okay. And I figured if I had the job, I better know. I think I probably went to the record store and got everything. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, I was familiar with some. I, I had I had 1999, Controversy, and uh, like Around the World in the Day Parade, like a lot of the 80s records I had. But I had to go back to like the late 70s for like that stuff and, yeah. you know, and then learn whatever. Uh, you know, but at that time we was really focused on the Batman soundtrack. So okay, I listened to that a lot. Uh, but yeah, eventually, I, yeah, I just kind of got it all under my belt because I was like, just I could just tell by what kind of situation it was. It's like I need to know everything. But yeah. to be fair, I did the same thing when I went on tour with Paul Westerberg. So okay, I, I bought all the replacements records. I you know, and I just I yeah. didn't like to be unprepared. Right, yeah. exactly. Did you research? Yeah. And I don't I don't want to 
this whole thing isn't going to focus on your time with Prince, but I, I just, I have a couple other questions here. We can talk about whatever you want, man. I'm, I'm easy. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I, and everything is based on hearsay that, that we've heard that, you know, the general public has heard about Prince. So how was it in the studio? I mean, when, when he, when you're working on a new album, is he bringing stuff in or is he letting you guys collaborate or, or is he more of a field general? Like, all right, you're doing this, you're doing this and you're doing this. All of those things. I okay. mean, there was no one way to, to skin a rabbit. And right. sometimes he'd walk in with his notebook. Sometimes he'd walk in with the notebook. And you, you remember those cassette decks? They were like rectangular and you got the speaker. Oh, the like and, big, yeah. The, 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 like the like one a Panasonic. It's got a handle. Yes. And it's a, yes. Yeah. He would, he'd come walking in the studio sometimes with this tape deck. He, he kept... I, I, I used to think he kept two, one at the studio and one at home. But I think he literally took the one that was on top of his piano at home to the studio with him, oh. with the cassette in it. Wow. And he'd sit down at the piano and he'd play back ideas that he worked on earlier and then sit there and remember, get, his, get that under his fingers and then, and then start, you know, okay, this, the melody goes like this. Sometimes it was that structured. Right. But also other times we would just be in the studio funk and wait for him to show up and he'd walk in. And, what's that? What, what key y'all playing? And what, what's this? <laughs> and whatever we were jamming on was, you know, was what we were going to work on. <laughs> it sounds to me like Hendrix was like that, where he would just jam with everybody all hours of the night. Yeah. Is that, was that kind of what Prince was, was like? Speaking to band members from other groups that he had it was he was always like that wow. I, I guess i think i saw also i saw some footage of lisa coleman talking about 1999 it's like she walked into rehearsal and it was just the drum machine going and prince at the keyboard and he like come here learn this part wow. and then he moved to another instrument and by the time the bass player shows up here do this you know like he would jam for hours. Oh my gosh. That's some, yeah. I'm getting, see the way I've always pictured it. It's like you guys are kind of like doctors where you're on call when Prince has an idea and he's just reaching out to everybody, get to the studio now. And you, everybody jumps in the car, jumps to the studio and uh, you're not that far off. I, but I, I said that we were more like firemen. Ah, uh, yeah. My, my, yeah, my, that was always my kind of, uh, I like it. Juxtaposition on it. it was like, you know, I get paged in the middle of the night and I got to get up and go out to Paisley Park. Wow. You know, and so it was more like, it was like there was a raging inferno and somebody had to go put it out. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's a perfect analogy. I love it. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. You played on four studio albums with him from what, 89 to 96. It, is there like a, a favorite memory, like a favorite gig or session or maybe something that was even a little unusual, even for Prince that, that you were a part of? Wow, man. I mean, it's, I don't have the objectivity to say because okay. it wasn't like a gig where fun was the goal. Okay. You know what I mean? It's like, if, if I was there, if I was there to enjoy I might have, have the information might live different in my body, Okay, but it was very, it was more like being in the military than <laughs> thing, in, in anything else. And I don't mean that in any kind of clouded sort of way. Right. It's just the, the job required a lot of discipline and you had to be almost telekinetic or not tele, but psychic, right. you know, sometimes cause he really didn't, he, he was not one to talk a whole lot. If he felt particularly chatty one day, you know, here or there, that, that was one thing, but yeah. he really wanted there to be a, this level of communication on like, I mean, that was what, it, what he was always angling for. So he'd only give you enough information to get you started wow. and then you're there. But me, I'm surrounded by these incredible players and I'm the youngest one. <laughs> I was always um, reticent to just put my hands down and start playing. And he recognized that hesitation within me and he helped me conquer it. He said, just put your hands down. I mean, but, but you have to deal with this paradox, which is you need a sense of adventure, but you also need to like remember everything. Like you need the stability of someone who's keeping track of everything yeah. while you're 
working in this creative mode. So it's like, that's great. Don't forget that. Right? Yeah. <laughs> a lot of that. It's yeah. like, well, wait a minute. I don't even know what I did. What, what happened? Yeah. A lot of that. Yeah. So you need, so it, you had to be efficient, but you also had to be like in for the, for the chase. And there's not a lot of time in between those two things to enjoy what's going on. And also you're talking about somebody who's cha- who changed the show in the middle of the show, right? Just by giving you a certain cue, you know? <laughs> Yeah, it's like you didn't really, you couldn't never let your guard down. And that's kind of when, you know, when your guard down is when you have, you can have the best times in life often when you weren't expecting, you know? So it really wasn't, I mean, I'm not saying I didn't enjoy myself. I mean, it was, it was an experience that I, has been so valuable to me. I mean, what I was saying earlier is that he helped me to conquer the sort of fear of just allowing the music to dictate to me. Like I did, I I had such a, an obsession with being perfect and perfection Mm -hmm. that I didn't want to make any mistakes in front of anybody, especially these dudes. And Prince was just like, listen, you have to put your hands down, man. Yeah. Just put them down. He's like, you, you know, if you're going to find the street, you have to start with the city. Right. Like you, you, like you have to begin the process somewhere. Like, Sometimes he was really generous that way. And other times it was like, we're walking to the stage. He's like, we're recording tonight. Don't mess up. <laughs> <laughs> oh. and now the thing is, is he recorded everything. So the fact that he was saying this was like, he's just, you know, he's wow. kind of playing mind games with you a little bit, oh you know, it gosh. was, so he could afford to be that playful. We could not be right. We had to be, you know, so, you know, he'd say like, they dig it when I make mistakes, but you guys don't get to make any. Wow. Oh, so that's kind of how it went. You know, your, your tenure with Prince ended in 96. How did that end? Was it something you, you wanted to branch off and do other things or is he going in a different direction? He was, well, we were, yeah, he was going in a different direction from us. Yes. <laughs> he was going. <laughs> yes, he was. I think we all had had enough of one another at that point. I don't want to say it was like a super, there wasn't a whole lot of acrimony. I mean, and in time, I, I figured out that he really did me a favor because I could have stayed there probably for a few more years, but I never would have really known what I could do on my own power in the world, Uh, you know? Yeah. So as much as it was, I mean, it's a, you know, a gilded cage. It's, you know, you're for sure. It's great, but this is what it is. You know, it's like, well, what would happen if all this was taken away? And so I got the chance to find out, you know, not only that, I mean, eventually we, we mended our ways and I went back to recording for him, you know, kind of here and there. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I, I, uh, the tenure ended in 96, but I was back in 98 and I played a couple of songs on um, a record called Raven to the Joy Fantastic. I recorded and one of them was a duet with Cheryl Crow called Baby Knows. think actually came out now i'm remembering but from there we kind of you know we kind of got back to a friendly place and and from there uh kind of a, a, a co-worker sort of not co-worker but you know just like i wasn't under his employ but he'd call when he needs something needed something okay so okay you know that all kind of climaxed in 2009 when we actually played the joe the, the joe the jay leno show with him like we we were in L.A. to play a trio set. Me and Sonny were in L.A. to play a trio set with with Prince at the Conga Room, which is, I think, in the Staples Center. And uh, that led to the TV performance.
it was like for a minute, it was like things were starting to heat up. But I had joined Soul Asylum in 2005. Right, and right, yeah. I had a job. Yeah. You know, Dave and Dan were like, hey, hey, listen, buddy. You know, like, yeah. <laughs> like we think you're great. We want you in the band. We don't want to be playing with other drummers. So listen, you know, you're going to be a part of us. Like, yeah. All the way, like Dave and Dan were very generous to me. They were like, "We want you here. We will share our earnings with you." Wow! You know, so oh, they made me kind of an even partner. That's you know? incredible. Oh, it's so that's amazing yeah. to hear. Ah, yeah, I had been in between working for Prince and Soul Asylum. I had been working all over the well, not all over the world, but mostly Europe. I was uh, the musical director for an Italian artist for a few years. The first thing that Sonny and I did after Prince let us go was uh, a tour in France with a, a French singer named Franz Gall. Yeah, I did see that. That looked awesome. Yeah, and that was with like David Sanctus from Peter Gabriel's band and yeah. Sting's band. He was playing keys, and um, uh, this guy Reggie Calloway, who had had a band called Midnight Star in the early eighties. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. That had uh, like Freakazoid. No, yeah. no, no. Uh, what is it? No parking on the dance floor. Reggie wrote all of that, so he was like one of the background singers. And Keith John, who was a background singer with Stevie Wonder, it was an incredible band. And from there, we made connections that we still hold on to till this day. Yeah, and, uh, definitely. I've got some questions about some of these these bands, because some of them I went yeah. back and, and listened to, and it, they're amazing. Between Prince and and Soul Asylum, you know, you, you have worked with some amazing stuff. And I've, I went back and tried to listen to as much as I could. And all right. I have got to say that, and I'm trying to pull it up. I'll, I'll start off. I'm trying to find out exactly where I am on my notes. So I'll, I'll start listing some of these people while I'm looking for what I'm looking for. Paul Westerberg, uh, Shaka Khan. He was actually, he, he was actually first. He, cause I, he was recording in studio B at Paisley while we were rehearsing to go on tour. And some guy oh, actually was the, the assistant engineer on the session was sitting on a chair in front of the door. So nobody would come in. I guess Paul probably said, I don't want anybody just walking in here, man. Right. You know, so that was instead of being in there doing his job, he was he was th th at the door. Like, wow. I said, I said, what's going on? Why are you out here, man? It's oh, well, Paul Westerberg's in there. I said, he's recording in there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I said, OK. And I came back when he was, had gone to the bathroom or something. Right. And just went in there, you know, and just. <laughs> Started talking to Paul. Hey, what's up, man? And he was like, dude, where did you get that outfit? I'm like, and, you know, and I don't realize we dress like a bunch of, you know, Romulans every day, you know, because <laughs> we just, you know, I mean, there was a wardrobe department at Paisley and, you oh know, if, if it was dress, if it was dress rehearsal, you know, I walk in there and I've got this, these flashy clothes on looking like, uh, like shaking to your leader. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> He's like, wow, that's, that, that's cool. They make that for you. So we start talking about clothes and, you know, wow. <laughs> and all sorts of stuff. And then he's just like, oh, hey, um, I got a couple of songs that I need drums on for this record. It was for uh, eventually it was the second solo release. Oh, OK. Yeah, yeah. And I played on two songs, a song called My Century and another one called Time Flies Tomorrow. And tomorrow will make a day since we've met. Swing from the ceiling. He was like, well, do, do you have a minute? I'm like, yeah, man. And Magoo, my drum tech, dragged like a kick and a snare and a hi-hat and a floor tom and a cymbal into Studio B. And we just kind of cut. 
Wow. And then oh. the next day we did it again for the other song. And then he was the first person to call when it, news got out that we had been fired. Hey, I heard you. I, I heard you got you, you got canned. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Like, yeah. Well, yeah. I'm well. I'm going on tour this summer. You want to go? I'm like, well, yeah. I don't have anything else to do, man. Let's do it. So <laughs> that's awesome. Oh my gosh. So so uh, yeah. How about that? Yeah. The, at that time, though, you're you're doing so much stuff. You're so busy because I was looking at at the list of, of bands you've played with and you've played for. Um, all right, so we mentioned Paul Westerberg, Shaka Khan, Maxwell, but at the same time, you're also contending for spots with like Guns and Roses and a Perfect Circle. I mean, it just just blows my mind. I I mean, that's such an incredible group of musicians. Yeah, but let, let me clarify because no, that I, I think the connection was that Josh Freeze and I were both uh, kind of around the Guns N' Roses camp at the same time. I Perfect Circle had nothing to do with me. Nobody. I did do a recording session with Sylvia Massey once Ooh. in Weed, California. She <laughs> she, she had a, a studio in a movie theater, an abandoned movie theater. And I, I went there to record some tracks for a band she was producing. Uh, so okay. th- she did tell me some good stories about Maynard, but I no, I never I never met him. I, I met Josh Wikipedia. at some point, but yeah. I mean, you know, people, you know, you know how it is. Yeah. You can't control information oh, yeah, anymore. Yeah. It's the internet. Exactly. But, uh, yes. yes. So uh, yeah, but I mean, really, if I explain to you the timeline, it might make more sense. I mean but I, I'd rather you be amazed and, yeah. <laughs> and guffawed. So I'm okay. sorry. I'll keep, I'll stop interrupting you. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> but one of the, the projects that I listened to that I thought was just incredible because I like jazz. I'm not an aficionado. I'm not super knowledgeable about it, but I like to listen to it when I'm in the mood for it. And I hope I pronounce this dude's name right. Michel Portal. That's him. The yeah. Minneapolis Project. I was listening to that. I mean, the, all right, so be Besides you and Michelle, I mean, there's Tony Hyman, uh, Sonny, Sonny T, Vernon Reed, Jeff Lee Johnson. I mean, that's huge. The song, I, I, good Lord, I'm going to butcher this. Uh, Mator, 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 Malay. Okay. And uh, you guys did Mingus's Goodbye Pork Pie Hat. Those are just unbelievable. They, they floored me. It's, it's just so good. How did you guys get yeah, that project it. start? I think it was it was a, a Frenchman named Jean Rochard. And he was, a, he was a drummer from Paris, as far as I can remember. He had started producing records for Sony had like a little um, Sony France had a like a like a little uh, what do they call it a subsidiary label like uh, like jazz jazz something that makes and he total was producing, sense producing records for for this label and um he'd been spending time in Minneapolis his baby and his woman lived here so he was spending time here okay, okay. and i think he saw us or knew about us from when we uh, when Sonny and i had performed with prince in Paris in France. They loved Prince yeah. much more in Europe than I think he ever was loved in, in the United States. They entertained his his muse a little more. Uh, they, okay. that makes they embraced sense. all his eccentricities and I can a, see a, a lot more there. But uh, so he just, I, I want to say he approached us at Bunkers, but it might have been more formal than that. I can't really remember, but he was saying he had a, a French woodwind player named Michel Portal, who wanted to make a kind of a, a, he wanted to experiment. He wanted to make a record in Minneapolis and uh, that he wanted us to be the rhythm section. And he started talking about Tony Hymas would be the keyboard player Jeez. and that they were talking to Vernon Reed about flying in to play with us. Wow. Vernon got there like by like the third day of recording. By then, 
we were transformed. It was a weird sort of language going on in the studio. Really? Like, yeah. I mean, uh, the first day I was really frustrated because I kept trying to gain some sense of what was going on. And I, I, Jean Richard says, Michael, is there something wrong? I say, yes, <laughs> I can't gain any objectivity over the situation. I don't understand what I'm supposed to be doing. Cause I, while I like a, a lot of jazz, I don't necessarily enjoy playing it. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm not, I used to tell people I hate jazz. I, there's a, actually there's an, a French article about that project where I, I, I and I, I, I don't, I can speak a little French, but I, I saw, uh, like my initials and then my quote, it was, je déteste jazz. <laughs> <laughs> like, Oh, I hate jazz. I used to like to say that to wind these people up who just thought that jazz was just everything. Right. I'm like, music has equal value. It's uh, every music is valid. Yes. And so I used to wind the snobs up by being contrary. I, you know what I mean? I love that. <laughs> You know, and I had all the all the requisite releases. I had Giant Steps. I had Kind of Blue. Yeah. I, you know, I, I I liked Miles Davis a lot. The quintet period, Tony Williams. It's you can't really get better than that, as far as I'm concerned. It's uh, you know, I, I think I heard Nefertiti by accident, and then I bought ESP, Cooking at the Plug, Nickel, Sorcerer. I just got obsessed with like everything, like from '65. To like through like bitches brew. Okay. And I would listen to these cassettes on auto reverse all night. So, I mean, I knew something of it, but I didn't want to be pigeonholed. And I wasn't trying to say I'm a jazz drummer because I know what kind of discipline and what kind of, uh, uh, just what I have a, a glimpse into what it takes to be a good jazz musician. And I don't think of myself that way. And not only that, I met a real one. His name was Eric Gravatt, and he had played with Weather Report and the Coy Tyner. Wow. And, but he was, at the time I met him, he was just starting to play again, but he had been like a, a CO at Stillwater Prison in Stillwater, Minnesota. Whoa. Yeah. He had retired play, from playing music, and then he started playing out again. And my uh, Floyd Thompson, my, my drum teacher when I was a kid, yeah. was always like, if you ever get a chance to take lessons with Eric Gravatt, do it because he's incredible. Oh, wow. And I finally see Eric playing at this club called the fine line in Minneapolis. And I get up my nerve to go talk to him. And he's uh, like, he's just, he's a little upset because the audience is a bunch of yuppies and they're not really listening. Oh. And like, he was, he was pretty disgruntled, man. Like he kind of, he, he had some hard exterior. Okay. And I'm like 17 going, Mr. Gravat, sir. <laughs> like the, uh, like the kid in the Simpsons, yeah. like the, hey, the kid with the pimples. Yeah. Oh, sir, excuse me, sir. Yeah. Uh, uh, my drum teacher told me that if I ever had the opportunity to take lessons with you, that I, that I should, I should do it. And he, and without looking at me, he's tearing his drums down. He said, he said, I saw you the other week, you know, playing in the middle of the street over there. You don't need no lessons. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I heard you. I heard you already. You don't need no lessons. Oh and, uh, you know, so I, I just leave them alone. And then we run into, it, run into each other at the record store, like two years later at Electric Fetus. Like I'm shopping in the jazz section and I hear somebody walk up behind me. And say, you, hey, you want some lessons, man? <laughs> I say, Whoa, what's going on, man? You know, so we became friends, wow. you know. Just oh, just a, a just a master musician. He doesn't live here anymore, but I like he. I want to say he played on. I sing the body electric, like everything up through like Sweet Nighter by Weather Report, and then I mean wow. just the most incredible drummer. When he solos, it's like listening to a singer. It, it's it like that's when you you know how certain people, certain enlightened people will say they know how much they don't know by what they do know, yeah, you know yeah. or vice versa. That's what it is. It's like, I, I know enough about drumming and music to know that's not my bag. I stay out. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And so I was already disgruntled going into this session talking about, it's going to be a jazz record. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not a jazz musician. Why are you calling? Yes. But you play with such strength and sensitivity at the same day. This was telling me what I'm bringing to the, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So first day I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing here. He says, 
You don't need objectivity. This is a subjective study. Okay. And I said, okay. So I got a little, you know, I'm fine. Really? Let's see. Yeah. <laughs> and then, so I turn up the juice, you know, and all of a sudden everything starts to transform because Sonny is like my, my wonder twin. Yes. We, we speak without talking. So we start cranking it up and, you know, it's the day started really strangely because Tony, we had like eight months advance. Like we knew like eight months in advance that this record was going to be recorded. Oh, okay. Wow. In between Tony Hymas is at home writing material for the record. So finally this day comes where, okay. All right. We're in the studio. Tony says, right. This one is called uh mature, mature Malay. And uh, it goes like this gentlemen. And he starts <laughs> playing. He's like, yes, yeah, yes. But uh, uh, you know, I think we came back around to that after about six or seven rejections in a row. Like Michelle would sit there with his horn and Tony would play. And he, no, 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 Tony. I, I don't like, I don't like Tony. I, it's, I'm, uh, you know, please wow. uh, too classic. And me and Sonny, okay. We'd sit there. We were just waiting to see what we're going to do. Right. <laughs> right. Well, I got this ditty called, you know, and no, no, too classic. I, I know I don't like. I don't like, oh, it's too similar to this. I, I don't like, Tony. I don't like. After the seventh piece of music goes up, while Tony is fidgeting for another piece of music to put on the piano, Sonny starts playing something for about like three seconds, just, you know, and Michelle jumps out of his chair and says, that's it. <laughs> we play that. That, Sonny, what is that? We play that. <laughs> And Sonny said, play, play what, man? He said, no, oh, you played something. That, that thing's there. We play that. Oh, and, man. Okay. All right. Like, so we just go for it. And this dude is, he's over the moon with joy. It's like, this is what I want. And the rest of the session goes this way. And it's like, Tony has probably 150 compositions right. <laughs> sitting over there. We managed to get to a couple. Oh, that's good. But... But most of that record was like very, I can't, can't really explain it. It just was this sort of perfect storm of excitement, but mystery. Uh, it, you know, I mean, sure, you have like Goodbye Pork Pie Hat and you have some of those things are you know, relatively classic. But right. we didn't really know where Michelle was trying to go. He didn't have, he couldn't speak a whole lot of English. So we only knew when it was what he wanted. Oh, when he, <laughs> he made that yes, obvious. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. It's like and when he heard it, he knew he knew what he wanted. Yeah. We just had to give it to him. And he knew and what so, he didn't but, want, apparently. That's right. And I'm, unfortunately, I'm like, wow, that's I feel bad for Tony. He spent months writing these songs and the dude's rejecting them in a row. Yeah. Oh, you know. So uh, by the time uh, by the time Vernon got there. We were like speaking alien talk, you know, it's like, it was like, um, I think the song might be sky tinted water. Okay. Like it was this thing where it was like, it, it, it was just a gesture I was making to Sonny when I was going to play and when I wasn't. And it was just, and Tony was just being Tony, just yeah. like, <laughs> and Sonny was watching my hands and I, I'd like, like, like give him a nod, like here, Sonny. And I'd play a little. And we would start and stop at the same time, but it was not planned. It was completely spontaneous, right. totally. And like, I don't know how we did that, but it's like, and then John returns, that was incredible. I, that, that was amazing. It was so great, you know? So uh, we got there, but it was like, it was really, by the time Vernon got there, it was like for the first half of the session, he didn't know what to do. Yeah. It was like listening to, you know, four Romulans talking <laughs> and, and you don't speak the language. It's, but so we had to eventually give him something to, to grab onto. So yeah. like Dred Scott marker mm -hmm. was kind of initiated by him and a couple other things. Okay. But um, yeah. And Jeff Lee joined the ensemble after um, we made a different record for the Sony Jazz France label. Uh, uh, that record was called News from the Jungle. Right, yes. Okay, I, I listened to that, too.
met Jeff when I joined Chaka Khan's band. Jeff was coming in to sub for Mike Campbell, this guitar player who had been with her for years. He had a gig in Japan with, uh, uh, I can't remember the dude's name now, but he, he was the lead singer of Cool and the Gang, but he had his own gig in in Japan. Okay. Shaka Shaka heard a record called Blue by Jeff Lee and immediately fell in love with this plane. So when Mike said, I, hey, Shaka, I can't play the Hollywood Bowl gig. I'm going to be out for, you know, she immediately called Jeff. Oh, who had man. Been, he had been playing, I think, with D'Angelo around that time. Oh, uh, okay. So both he and I had our first encounter with Shaka the same day, and, oh, which was wow. rehearsal for this gig at the Hollywood Bowl. And um, I he didn't know me. I didn't know him. He's very, he was not antisocial, but he really didn't, he didn't, he didn't, he just didn't, didn't like, I, I, I don't want to say he didn't like talking. He just, I think maybe he just didn't like people, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, you know, cause people, people sort of suck, you they know? Do. So he just sat on, on the couch, you know, with his guitar, just kind of warming up and didn't say much to anybody, you know, until it was time for him to play. But during that tour with Chaka, we really bonded. And I was like, we got to play with Sonny, man. He's like, oh, okay. Who's Sonny? Sonny's the dude that, yeah. I'm like, yeah, we played in Prince's band together. And so we got together and it was just like, wow, this is incredible. It was like the new power trio on steroids because while Prince was an amazing guitar player, Jeff Lee Johnson was a different animal. Yeah. He really he, is. Um, I mean, he, he's amazing. Well, was, I mean, well, he, yeah, he yeah. died some years ago, but yeah, is amazing. If you put one of those records on, yeah, yeah. you'll get your clock cleaned. He was an incredible musician. I mean, uh, the baddest man walking uh, in, in my opinion, when he was walking. Uh, <laughs> uh, so yeah, the three of us got together and started playing and then John Richard was like, oh, hey, we need to make an album. You, th you three? Yes, definitely. You know, so a lot of it was John Richard just seeing these things kind of play out, you know, and understanding these relationships that were going on. And I'd mentioned to him like, oh, hey, you know, so-and-so's in town. And really? Uh, you know, he, he just was, he kept the whole thing kind of moving. Okay. You know? Well, like a good yeah, producer. Yeah, no, a good producer. I never heard him play drums. I hope he was a good one, but he <laughs> liked how I played. So, you know, and um, yeah, so it was a very specific time. And we, at one point, Jeff Lee and Sonny and I were all playing with Georgia, this Italian artist. And she had like a, a two week break in her tour. And we did a short tour of France during that break from, from her gig. Oh. And, you know, we didn't know really what to expect. We didn't even have really a repertoire. We just kind of all knew the same music, like Sly Stone, Al Green, P-Funk, all of that. So I'm like, well, what are we going to play? And Jeff said, don't worry about it, man. He was always very sure that everything was going to be great. Wow. Oh, man. <laughs> He's like, well, I don't know what you're going to do, but I'm going to kill it. <laughs> well, all right. Okay, man. Well, you know, it was kind of like that. Like, he knew his power. Like, uh, you know, it, they had him do... Like he was a guest at a thing that that John Richard put together for Jeff Beck, and Jeff played over there with Jeff Lee. Uh, went to France and did this thing, and he's, what I heard about the gig was that Jeff Beck was like looking at him like, "Where are you from? Like, who are you, man? Like, wow. how'd you learn how to play like that? Like, like, like Jeff Beck was kind of attempting some of the things that Jeff had been playing, you know, wow. in, in the opening set." Oh. And, you know, about this i asked jeff about it. he's like yeah man i was like why is he trying to bite my ribs i'm nobody he's jeff beck yeah he says but the same thing happened with benson <laughs> wow. so Jeez. just to get an understanding of how revered he was as a guitar player yeah you know and unsung you know i mean he never got the credit he deserved no never you know I, and i was listening to news from the jungle today and it's Oh, yeah, and it just that it, dude. It's it, it just yeah. It just re reminded me how good he was because, like you said, he's unsung. And it, unfortunately, for, you know, for me, I, it's it's one of those things I had forgotten how good he was because I hadn't heard him in a, in such a long time. And yeah, it, he needs that to be happens. more well known. He he needs to. I don't know. Not, yeah, I know. It's funny because the last gig I played with him was at the Blue Note in New York City. It was he? It was him and. uh 
Johannes Tona, this Ethiopian bass player who lives in Minneapolis or lives in Minnesota. <laughs> was doing the thing with Georgia and uh, he took over as her music director. So he was spending a lot more time in Italy. Johannes and I just like, I just said, well, let's actually Jeff was like, get that young boy to play. And so he took a, a shine to, to Johannes. And uh, so we, um, what, where was I going with this? <laughs> we uh, <laughs> Happens to me all the time. I can't remember now, man. But anyway, that was also a very good trio. I remember the first day we rehearsed some, some music that we hadn't played before. And Jeff was the type of dude who was like, don't waste it. Don't waste it in rehearsal. Don't blow yourself out because okay. it's going to become something else. Once we take it to the stage, like he believed in the theory that there's only so many notes, like oh, wow. so there's only so many, so many good notes you're going to get. And so we started playing the song. I think it's called sizzling. Okay. Uh, and I, I swear we played maybe about 15 seconds. He, uh, 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 stop. Hold on cats. Wait, no, don't waste it here. Wow. <laughs> oh. You know? Um, oh, okay. All right. Like he was really that dude. Like he also, oh someone had told him once that the best music is never recorded. And it's an interesting theory because I don't mean to get so wide no, about no, it. It's fine. Have you seen straight? No chaser. The Thelonious Monk. Uh, no documentary no i have not there's a scene in it where monk is like okay let's go we're gonna try this song and it's like i think it's tio Macero was was the producer in the studio and it's footage of of monk working in this in, in the we're, they're working the song out and all right let's try it you know and like uh hey a hey, monk do we want to roll on this well no no we just we're just working on it and the take is incredible and Monk is like, has forgotten that he told nobody to record this shit. So uh. it's like, and so he's like, this, well, that was, uh, that was it, man. Play it back. And then it's like, uh, well, uh, oh, we didn't, uh, we didn't actually, what? You didn't record. Yeah. Like he's uh, like, he's not, it's not even processing yeah. for him that nobody hit the red button. You just see Monk going, well, well, okay, well, but just play it back. I just want to hear what it sounded like. Yeah. Well, he uh, told us not to worry about it. Kind of, but I mean, they're more respectful than that. Yeah, exactly. He's, <laughs> he's, he was a giant. I mean, yeah. I don't know if he was, I don't know if he ever lost his cool, but they were being very, you know, they tried to tell him with as little, a few words as possible yeah. that they messed up, you yeah. know, or not messed up, but it was like, uh, what do they say now? ABC always be, re uh, or no, uh, not always be, re always be recording. Yeah. No, that's not ABC. It always be, uh, <laughs> I don't know what it is. I, uh, but, always be closing. So, <laughs> yes, that's, well, there you go. <laughs> but, um, so I, you know, in that respect, I'm like, well, maybe Jeff Lee is, was right about that. Maybe. Like, had the camera not been rolling, who knows if anybody would have even heard that yeah. one rendition that was, so incredible. Yeah. And that, that's why I kind of subscribe with, with the podcast is, is some of my, my most fun moments in the podcast are when I'm just chatting with people before we get down into things. So I kind of subscribe to the Neil Young process of just record everything. Yes. So. I got you. Yeah, yeah. I understand that. A lot of shows, I, there was, there's a pre-show that I, I did, did a, another podcast a couple weeks ago. And it's like, well, the official show starts at eight. But we usually get on at 7.45 and start chopping it up. You know, no, okay, that's fine, you know. And it, yeah, it, it's, you know, and some funny things happened. And, it, oh, yeah. you know, it was, I understand why it's a good thing to do. Yeah. But, you know, also, uh, on the flip side, like, musically, I, I really don't like to waste notes. I don't like to, you know, I do sessions for people sometimes, and they'll say, well, hey, man, that's great, but can you give me one take where you just, like, just completely just, uh, you know, yeah. And I'm like, I, no, I don't want to do that, you yeah. know, because once I've taken my approach 
you know, as much as I've, I've taken the space I've developed away from myself because I'm working on something. Mm -hmm. I'm working on what is the right way to, to push this music along. I'm not thinking, how can I get all my be best chops in? And, you know, so when you hear it on the radio, it sounds like a Billy Cobham record. Right. I'm not thinking, you know, so they don't always understand that about me, but I'm like, I don't, I don't throw away anything. I don't waste it. I play what needs to be played. And then I'm, I'm kind of done. Like I shut the door on it. Okay. You know? Okay. So I was introduced to you through, uh, our mutual friend, Ryan Smith. Smith. Yeah. yeah. S M I F F. We call yeah. Yeah, He said to say hello. Smith, hey, what's going on, Smith? I reached out to him. Like, today. I, I told him, okay. I told him cause you know, he just introduced us uh, just a couple of days ago. So I told him, I said, oh, yeah, Mike right. and I are recording today. So this is going to be great. So he said to say you hello. Know, Yes, absolutely. I mean, I just, I wanted to get it out, uh, not out of the way, but I'd rather do it now because I'm working on this gig, which I hope we were going to talk about uh, yes. uh, for Saturday, April 20th at the Uptown Theater in Minneapolis, Okay, which is me and Sonny. It's kind of our record release party for a single uh, we're releasing on the 19th called Brother. It's kind of a theme song. I mean, uh, the Sonny, is, uh, our duo, the name, we, we're brothers. Uh, but it's like a <laughs> it's in the there's parentheses there's in parentheses is the br right uh, so you had it's like brothers but we're kind of others right like somebody who heard us play who sonny knew when he was like a kid was like man you know he's like sonny it's like sonny came from outer space man like his musical aptitude was way you know he had more than the rest of us and we didn't didn't understand how come you know, and he just like Sonny didn't was not formally trained in music. So this guy tells me all about Sonny. Like I said, well, then how did he communicate? He said, well, if he wanted us to play like a like a like a D seven sharp 13, he'd say like uh, D James Brown chord, you know, <laughs> or he'd say, you know, or if, like it was like a major seven or something. He'd say like uh, D pretty chord. Like that's how Sonny communicated with his band. Members. Oh, that's great. Later on, he did study music theory and he read, I mean, he has all the information, but when he was younger, he didn't have it yet. So he had to communicate the way he knew how, you know, and by the time I've talked to this dude for about five minutes, he's looking at me, he said, now that I've heard you two play together, I think y'all came down together in the same pot. <laughs> like you kind of, you kind of freaky like him. <laughs> and it always stuck with me. I'm like, yeah, there's a thing when Sonny and I play together, Something happened. Yeah. I can't really explain it to you, but I, I like the first time we played together, we looked at each other like, where have you been all my life? Oh, you know, I love that. So the song is kind of a, a, a tribute to my relationship with Sonny Thompson. I, um, I want to get into it in a little more detail. So how yes. did you start working with Soul Asylum? How did, how did you get meet those guys? And because and, you've been on every, you said from 2005. So you've been with them since that every album since 2006. Yes, that's right. I had met Dave and Dan and Carl, you know, around town. Danny and Carl actually went to Marshall U High with my a couple of my sisters. So oh, wow, okay. You know, I find this all out after we really got to know each other. But uh, kind of like you know, they were they had gone on hiatus for about six years. Dave moved to New Orleans. He made a solo record called Faces and Names. And which was a great record. Uh, he was starting this new life in New Orleans. And at some point they decided, hey, why don't we get back on the horse? You know, and they hadn't had like a real steady drummer. So the, fir uh, the first call came in 04, which was Soul Asylum was talking about working on a new record. Would you be interested in being the session guy? Okay. I said, sure. And I think at some point somebody questioned whether I was the right guy or not. Because, you know, a lot of people like to think of me as like a funk drummer or an R&B drummer because I played with Prince. But right. if you know Prince's music, you know, R&B isn't half of it. Right. Prince played all kinds of music. And uh, so, you know, and, and, and plus, I mean, listen, I, I'm a Midwesterner. I grew up on FM album rock. How am I not going to be a rock and roll drummer? Well, you were playing <laughs> yeah. Eruption and Led Zeppelin in your basement. That's what I'm saying. But nobody knows that. They see black guy on the drums. Fun. Right. So, 
you know? Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it's funny because Westerberg, somebody asked Westerberg in like a, I think it was maybe a Spin Magazine article, like, what made you decide to get an R&B drummer? And I think Westerberg, I think he said, well, the guy sounds pretty rock and roll to me. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> you Excellent know? answer. So that was kind of his retort. I was like, thank Good. you, Paul. Because people want to pigeonhole you. Unfortunately, it's kind of, a, it's, a, it's, it's a matter of race, you know, yeah. in this country. Yeah. You know how Living Color, they tried to put Living Color's first record in the in the R&B section of the store. Yeah, makes no sense they, at yeah, all. Yeah, it's like, what are you doing, man? That's, That's the, uh, all that guitar? You obviously didn't listen to the album. Right, they're just black guys over oh, there, R&B, yeah. you know, exactly. kind of, you know? So, you know, you, you battle the stigma. And actually, I had a conversation with Jesse Johnson about this because, you know, Sonny and I, and uh, Tommy Barbarella, all from the the MPG, and my friend John Fields, who's uh, produced The Silver Lining and many other Soul Asylum records since. We worked with Nick Jonas in 09 and like two, through 2010. Yes. And uh, I remember Jesse saying, man, the, he's like, it, it warms my heart to see you brothers in a completely different environment, a different market. Because they try to pigeonhole us a lot. He's like, I love seeing us where we're not supposed to be. Right. You know? So, I mean, he really, you know, it's a it's a real thing, you know, that we have to combat, you know? For sure. Somewhat. Yeah, unfortunately, but, yeah. it's it, Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. So, well, well, how did I get to Soul Asylum? So, that was it. Yeah. First, you know, there was some equivocation over whether I was the right guy. But the call had been made. And I was like, yeah, okay. I'm not going to take this seriously. Because it had been probably, I mean, they were talking about you know, it was going to be probably four or five months from then anyway. And I hadn't heard any new news. And what ha- ended up happening is they postponed everything till 05. And uh, somewhere in between, I think I, uh, oh, during pre-production for rehearsal, well, I mean, for the, for the record, we were getting together and playing through the new material and, or whatever candidates they had for the new record. Right, right. And by like, I think at the same time, Somebody was having a benefit. One of their friends was sick or had hospital bills, you know, and they asked Soul Asylum, they play at a benefit. And they hadn't done any live gigs in years. But they say, okay, hey, man, you know, we're not getting paid for this thing. It's like, you know, if you need to get paid, you know, we'll arrange for it. I said, no, no, no. I'm okay, man. I'm here. Well, we just want to play these songs here. So we get into playing like, uh, like Somebody to Shove. You know, Black Gold, uh, Closer to the Stars. And by the second day of... And we're doing this while we're also working on the new material. Oh, okay. Okay. So, like, by the second or third day, Dave... I think Dave was, like, starting Closer to the Stars, and he just stopped. He said, wait a minute. He's like... What? He says, hey, why, why don't you just join the effing band, man? <laughs> you know? He didn't say effing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and... I sat there and I thought about it. I'm like for only a few seconds. And I said, okay. And that was literally how it went down. Sounds pretty simple. Yeah. And I, I asked him later on, I said, when you, you guys asked Sterling to join them, Sterling Campbell had been the, the drummer in the nineties with the soul sound. Right. I said, yeah. how long did it, <laughs> how long did it take Sterling to, to, to say yes? He's, oh man, that was a whole other situation. <laughs> 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 I'm not sure what was entailed, but I guess Sterling was a little more uh, maybe apprehensive than me. But it was the 90s, and, you know, those dudes were pretty wild. I remember calling him to, <laughs> to ask. There was a gig. I think I was double booked, like a, a one-off came up. Okay. And I was like, hey, man, I got to do this. Can I get somebody to cover the gig? And Prayer was like, oh, yeah, call Sterling. See, see if Sterling will do it. And... uh I think it was, might've been like a weekend, like a couple shows in a row. And it, you know, this was a couple months before. And I called Sterling and said, would you, Hey man, would you uh, be interested in, in uh, playing these couple of games with soul? And I, he's like, man, playing with soul asylum almost killed me. No. <laughs> <laughs> First he's like, I don't know, man. It's like, I mean, we, we were wild back in the day, man. I don't know if I, I'm like, it ain't like that yeah. no more, man. <laughs> Dave's got a, a five-year-old son. Yeah. Nerves, everybody's married, you know. Yeah. It's like, it's not what it was. Because right. I actually remember, I think I was at LaGuardia. And 
I was, I was, I, was, I, I went like, I, I think we were going to Spain to, uh, I was with Maxwell at the time, like in 99. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> or 98 or 99. And we're at like, uh, the curbside, like checking our bags. Yeah. Yeah. And this, this van pulls up <laughs> and, you know, a bunch of raggedy looking white boys fall out of it, you know, and start walking up, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, yeah, and one black guy and they come walking closer and I realize it's, Oh, it's so silent. <laughs> And I'm in front of all all these, you know, uh, how do you, I even explain Maxwell's band? It's like, it's an LA black band. Right, so it's yeah. like, you know, they're all dressed appropriately and, you know, kind of, you know, they look professional, like shiny, spookity, you know, and here comes these dudes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey, Michael Burn. Hey, Michael, how you doing, man? <laughs> and I, I mean, it, it looked like they had been in a fist fight. Yeah. Kind of like, let me it's t shirts, torn jeans, and, and literally falling out of a van. But yeah, like they, but yeah, it's, I'm like, <laughs> they're doing some, some hard living. Yeah. Like they do, those dudes are riding it hard, man. Yeah. You know, I'm like, wow. Uh, <laughs> and yeah. you know, so I understood Sterling, like, hey, man. Oh, how you doing? I had met Sterling like in 1990. He was, Playing with Duran Duran of all people. Really? Oh wow! Yeah, I, and I was on my first tour with Prince. It, it was the nude tour, and we were staying in the same hotel. And actually, Lou Reed was there too. Oh so my god! I got to like hang out with Lou Reed and talk to him. And what a what a great guy he was. I've yeah. heard that. But um, yeah. So I mean, I digress. <laughs> but I was like, those are some rough dudes. I don't know if I could ever really, you know. And this is before they. Even, this is six years before they asked. You know. <laughs> So I understood what Sterling was saying when he's like, hey, man, that gig can get kind of rough. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know, that was rock and roll. Per, yeah. Pern and those guys, they really, they, they live. They, they, yeah, that's, it was real. Yeah. You know, uh, so <laughs> I'm like, no, man, everything's cool. <laughs> you know, it's, <laughs> and he did it and everything was fine. You know, I mean, it's, you know, but uh, he survived. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> and when he said that, he's like, "I don't know." I thought about them walking up to the to the, to the curb at the airport. I'm like, "That's right." Yeah. It was like, I think somebody had a bloody nose. They were like, you know, like Perner, Perner has bad red eyes in the morning anyway. Oh, really? so he hadn't had his visine yet, and you know, he's got his like he's wearing his dickies, you know, yeah. <laughs> like full on. I mean, oh, that's awesome. It's what it is, you know, and he's not much different now. I mean, he doesn't, it's, it's, well, I mean, I guess everybody in the band is married except for him, but he's, he's living a, a much more, uh, it's, I mean, he's, he's got somebody. Yeah. So yeah. Like people think we're out there like, oh man, it must be crazy out there. I'm like, no, we're pretty boring, dude. Yeah. <laughs> like it's just me and JT and Ryan and you know, Ryan is giving, you know, guitar lessons from his bunk, yep. you know, yep. <laughs> and, you know, JT and I are, you know, chopping it up about something, you know, making plans and JT's my dude, man. We just, we're like this, you know, that's so awesome. Yeah. So it's a much more friendly incarnation of soul asylum, <laughs> which may internally, it might really bother Pern. I have no idea, but things are so functional. It's like, it's, you know, it's really like. It's just a, a group of great people. I'm looking, you guys are going out this summer and I cannot wait to see, I'll be at the show. Yeah. You guys are going to be at in Virginia, uh, in Bristow. So it's Our Lady okay. Peace, Soul Asylum, Stone Temple Pilots and live. It's just, right. that's just, just an insane well, lineup. I mean, that's, that's like my end of college lineup from the mid nineties. That's, that's that would, I would have paid tons of money to see that. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I realize it's it's gonna mean a lot to anybody who cares. Yeah, to anybody who cares about it, it's That's gonna be me. a big deal. So yeah, that is me. Uh, well, I'm honestly, fantastic. I've never seen Our Lady Peace live. I've never seen Stone Temple Pilots live, and I've never seen live live. And I I saw Soul Asylum back in '93, I think, on the Alternative Nation tour when they were touring with. That'd be a good time to see them. Yeah, yeah. It was Screaming Trees opening, and then Soul Asylum and Spin Doctors. Oh yeah, it was okay. Yeah, crazy. And I, I didn't really care about the Spin Doctors. I went to see Screaming Trees and Soul Asylum, and I got gotcha. you. It was amazing. Yeah. So, and I did get to see Dave and Ryan when they did the acoustic tour a couple of years ago. So that was pretty cool. Yeah, but, it's it's funny, man, because when you start thinking about it, 
there's only a few of those cats still standing. Yeah. You know, I mean, Perner is, you know, he's the last of a kind. Like, as far as, like, a front guy who was an entertainer with a guitar on, like, a front guy with a guitar, he's one of the very best to have done it. Oh, he, he's amazing you know? live. And, and and I think he's he's gotten better because, to be fair, I don't remember tons of the Alternative Nation tour. I got it. But the <laughs> show he did with Ryan, the acoustic one, was great because he's telling stories and and tell, yeah. letting you in on, on what's behind some of the songs and joking around with Ryan. on it, it was fantastic. It was so entertaining. In my opinion, Dave is one of the greatest. Yeah. I mean, first off, I mean, if you just want to talk regionally, or even just Minnesota, uh, easily the most successful rock band to ever come from Minneapolis. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, hands down. Like there's no, there's no comparison. The the replacements get all the love and all the you know they get all of that. Solo Sun, we get our fair share. But really, I, I I had a conversation with Dave one time. You know, where I don't know how how it came up. Oh, I think we were at a restaurant that I had been to with, with Paul, with, with Westerberg, like kind of oh, yeah. in, in his neighborhood. And we start talking about Paul and he's like, you know, and Dave says, he's like, you know, it's uh, uh, it'd be nice to have the, you know, the cred that Westerberg gets like Westerberg is almost a mythological character. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I think part of that is because he never really, he never really broke. That's you know what true. I mean? Yeah. Yeah. He's like every, one of every, you know, every songwriter's favorite songwriter. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you know what I mean? It's like, he's, he never became what's what Dave became. But uh, I, anyway, I mean, the conversation I had with Dave was basically like, he's not regretful. You know I mean? He's like, I know I, I, I'll, I'll take the success. Like I have no problem being successful without having the lore that goes yeah. with, so, I mean, he's, he's, he's happy with his place in history. I'm good. sure Paul is with his, you know, and they're, they're not so dissimilar uh, just as people really. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. I mean, they're both very well read when it comes to music. Mm-hmm. First time I went to Paul's house, he had all these books about jazz like stacked up in his living room. And I go in his bathroom and there's a huge poster of Thelonious Monk. Those dudes really, they're not who people think they are when it comes to music. Wow. Oh, man. I mean, they're much more varied and holistic about things. So a lot lot more well-rounded than people give them credit for. Yeah, they just like good music. They don't sit around all day listening to the Ramones or the Underground. Who screwed you? Yeah, uh, the Stooges. Yeah. They, They... they don't, that's not what they do. Okay. They, you know, they, I mean, Dave will text me in the middle of the night about like, uh, some, something he saw on YouTube about like Miles Davis, <laughs> like the, uh, like some documentary on sketches of Spain because Dave also plays trumpet. So he has a whole other world. Yeah. So they're not, they're, they're not these dudes who are like, you know, <laughs> diehards and, you know, I mean, there's a part of that, like their creed, yeah, their creed is their creed. They're both pretty stunning performers and, you know, they believe in direct honesty as songwriters. That's what I'm most proud about my association with Soul Asylum and even with Paul is that these are dudes who are actually really trying to say something with music. They're not just like trying to write a hit or trying to, you know, trying to pander to anybody. It's like this. No, this is what I do. I write songs about real things. That's Dave. I asked him, I said, what what, what do you you know? What is it? He said, uh, soul asylum music is for the disenfranchised. It's for, it's for outsiders. It's for people who don't fit into this structure, you know, that society, you know, tends to, you know, yeah. And, and I, th- we started playing a few gigs. I think by the time we got to Denver, there were so many hot girls at the gig <laughs> and on the bus, I say, you just told me this music is for the disenfranchised. I saw more <laughs> hot women in this club. He says, Michael, have you ever, I, he says, he says, I've never seen anyone more disenfranchised than a hot chick. Her <laughs> friends hate her. Guys are scared to talk to her. You know, it's like, he just went, I was like, oh, wow. Well, he didn't think about taught that me one. Something. He, he taught me something. I learned a lot hanging around Dave. Perner. That, that's, yeah. <laughs> I never, I would not have been able to come up with that one. That's fantastic. 
yeah, that music is about just, I don't fit in. And he really kind of doesn't. I mean, you're talking about a very successful singer songwriter who never really came to grips with where art meets commerce. Like he doesn't, it doesn't click for him. He doesn't, it freaks him out. He doesn't get it. So that's not, he's it. So it was never for the money right. for him. It was always about just like, I want to blow everybody else off the stage. It's about planting the flag. It's not about the money. That is so awesome. It's somebody who's actually had success to keep that, that yeah. viewpoint, I guess. So, yeah, I mean, he's, he doesn't drive like a, he's got a broke down Tercel <laughs> in his garage, you know, <laughs> like somebody picks him up for band practice. Oh. You know, it's like, he is not that it. dude. He's not, you know, if he spends money, it's on like eating really good, you know, food somewhere. Oh, he or, just got into my heart even more. Yeah. And, <laughs> that's all he really will splurge on other than that. But he'll also eat like a, you know, a, a, a truck stop turkey and cheese wedge just like nobody's <laughs> business he don't care man oh, he's that it. dude so all right so know. i've got okay a couple more questions and uh and, and i'll let you have the rest of your afternoon here but when did you and sunny decide to start this whole brothers project when did when did it click i mean because you guys have been playing together for like decades at this point on and off but for decades i mean i can tell you the, the story from my perspective because i kind of went I called Sonny. I'm like, listen, I, I was, I don't want to name names. Somebody provoked me. Oh, okay. Uh, I don't know how much of a Prince fan you are, but uh, back in October of 2023, the box set for the Diamonds and Pearls record came out. Right. Yeah, I did see that. And there was some talk about maybe doing some sort of a, a gig, something in commemoration. It never came together, you know, and I had been waiting. I sat back and watched all these records from the eighties get remastered and come out and the revolution, this, the revolution, that. Right. And I'm just like, okay, that's great. And you know, let them have their flowers. I'm not so concerned about that, but I don't want to say I've even have a, an ax to grind. Cause it's not really that because the people like what they like, mm -hmm. but they don't realize. I think it's, I think it's lost on some people and seem to be even the record, uh, even Warner brothers lost. Uh, what's lost what seems to get lost is that um, at the end of the eighties, like Prince was basically, I mean, he had one foot out the door. You know what I mean? Like things weren't working out. The right. first thing that worked after a few years was the Batman soundtrack, which was a tremendous payday for him. I thought the record was incredible, but it was kind of a situation. It's like, you can't lose. You know what I mean? It was, but love sexy kind of was a failure. Sign of the times was loved, you know, critically acclaimed, but I don't think it moved as many numbers as, uh, as some of his uh, records before. Maybe not what they were expecting so, it to. Well, he was also starting to change artistically. He was just going into a different space. Yeah. And it was less like funk and rock and more of this sort of other thing that he was just sort of chasing Prince, you know, musically, he, his imagination was, fertile soil all the time he could i mean he was i think i heard somebody refer to him as a hyper creative which is yeah. like one of those people who it's like he can't sleep at night because he's got an idea for a whole other record he hasn't even started recording it yet but he's got the concept wow you know while he's working on two other studio records at the time <laughs> right i mean this is literally a situation that happened i know this to be true because i was there and that was part of how he fell out with Warner Brothers. He mentioned a record called The Gold Experience in an interview he did for Rolling Stone. And he was on the phone with Mo Austin at some point. And Mo was like, hey, I heard you're working on that new record. Well, when it's finished, just, you know, send it over, you know. And uh, for some reason, Prince was like, I haven't even started writing for that record yet. He just mentioned that to Mo Austin. And Mo Austin was like, yeah, OK, well, anyway, I mean, either way, it's ours. You know, right? Oh, and, yeah. And Prince, yeah. And Prince was like, "So, wait a minute." You know, and Prince had a had a you know an epiphany. He's like, "Okay, this is how you see me." Yep, a commodity. You see me as a, as a commodity, as a workhorse. Yeah. And um, that's where he began to question all of it, and that conversation turned into something a little, a little ugly. Right. Is what understanding is, but like to tell somebody, I own the thoughts in your head. Yeah. To have the nerve to say it. Yeah, exactly. 
even if you think it, there's certain things you don't. I think a lot of I, I, I wish I said less, but I think a lot of things that I don't say because you just. Yeah. You know, especially something it, like that to somebody so creative. So prolific. Yeah. Who, yeah, who made them so much money and made pennies on the dollar in exchange. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, how dare you? Like, you don't have respect for what's, what's being done here. Yeah. You don't have any art, artistic in, inclination yourself. You, you're a salesman. Exactly. I have the wares. Yeah. You're a salesman. And that's kind of how I think they both said some things that day that they might have really, really regretted. You know, but it started that whole thing where all of a sudden I can't have my masters. I'm a slave. And every day walking into rehearsal, here comes Prince with slave written on his face, you know, wow. and, you know, just like, and then the plot just thickened and got the thing just, you know, yeah. imploded. But yeah, the gold experience was a record we were working on at the same time as we were working on another record called Comp. Okay. And it was just like about 30 or 40 songs. Like he had like two lists and he was just kind of picking and choosing which songs go with which. And at the, at the same time, we were working on a, a record called Exodus, like a band record called Exodus by the right, NPG. Yeah. I'm saying all this was going on at the same time. So oh, you don't wow. need, I, I didn't need someone to tell me that Prince was a hyper creator. Right. I mean, how are you writing different songs for different records? You know? Yeah. Y years worth of music going on at the same time. Right, exactly. He, and that was the problem that Warner Brothers really had with him, that he was, his problem was, I put out music, and it's a year old before you do, you know, I, I finish music, and I have to wait for a year. By the time you put my record out, all that's old. Yeah. When I write music, it's for the time and space in which I'm in. Yeah. And that's why he always was like, I, I want to go back to the model that James Brown had. James Brown, I don't know if you know this about James Brown or not. I mean, other than the fact that he had a private jet and on the side of the record, the windows were turned into like 45s and they were all like James Brown hits. <laughs> That's First awesome. off, yeah, that plane was that. But also James Brown owned his own pressing plant. He had two different labels. He had one for the singles and one for the albums. And he had his own radio station. I didn't know any of that. Yes. When he, at the time when he wrote, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. It was out in a couple of days and it was addressing the civil rights movement and so on and so forth. You yeah, know, yeah. that's what I'm saying. It's like music is, is timely. It's of the time. Music yeah. is history. Yeah. It's yeah. So, I mean, the fact that, you know, well, sorry, Prince, but I think Madonna was his, one of his uh, label mates. Yeah. Well, Madonna's got a new record coming out. So kind of everybody's focused on that now. And, you know, and Prince is like, what does that have to do with me? She's her. I'm me, you know? Yep. Now I'm giving you the content by the time you get it out. It's, you know, music has a shelf life too. You know, if sure. you're talking about marketing and addressing, if your music has a conscious a conscience to it. Uh, so anyway, that was yeah. the main that was the main problem. And, you know, I think it, it, I don't mean to go on about this, but I, and I'll wrap it up here saying that well, I think that when you're, when you don't create, you don't understand it. Like if, if the music business is run by people who are selling, they're not making, right. They're not even really a part of the process. Right. And, you know, to be fair, Prince took his advances or his, you know, the money that he was given up front and he built a home studio. That's yeah. what he did so that he could record whenever he felt like it, you know, like he could be sharpening his craft, you know, yeah. and not on anybody's dime. They're not paying him. Right. You know, so he always felt like, well, if I'm making it independently, why, why shouldn't I own it? I mean, I'm not taking any, any of your money for it. I'm giving you a finished product. Yeah. I wouldn't disagree with that. Yeah, sure. But of course they would because that's their angle. Exactly. That's how they make their money. So, yes. And he was astute enough to understand that. And anytime he started to talk about like, can we talk about this thing? Like, listen, you signed the contract. They go, go to, you signed the contract. And, you know, Prince was, <laughs> he was eccentric. He was <laughs> not crazy. Right. You know, he was, I mean, he followed a different pulse and he was tapped into certain things. I'm not going to say 
it's like some things defied a certain kind of rationalism. Okay. I don't want to mystify things too much. I'm right, just right. saying that music is a spiritual thing, man. And whatever you're into, whatever you're marinating in is what you're going to taste like. Right. You know what I mean? So I love that. Yes. That's, I mean, that's just how I, I mean, he just lived in this zone where he just, I mean, he empowered himself. He thought all things were possible. If you told Prince, no, you'd be, you'd have, you better clear an hour to explain to him why, <laughs> wow. you know? And uh, so it was, he was, he believed in himself like that, you know? Yeah. And um, he was, but well, back to the fact that he was like, yeah, okay, of course, I understand your handle. I get it. You distribute my music, you know, you put money down, you invest you know, in promotion. That's great. I'm not arguing about my contract. I'm just asking, yeah. how can we make this thing a little bit more fair? Right. Like, you know, you're killing me. You know, you're, you're making money hand over fist. Why can't we come to a more equitable agreement is all I'm asking. Right. And of course, it's like, no, 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 no. And when he signed his record deal with his first record deal, he was what, 18, 17? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. It's like you don't know anything at that age. You don't know legalese. And especially back you then, you know, know. it's the holy grails to get a record contract. Well, here's the other thing. I, and to Warner Brothers' credit, Dirty Mind was supposed to be Prince's was supposed to be Prince's last album for Warner Brothers. His three album deal was done, and it didn't look like they were going to sign him back. And actually, ironically, Mo Austin was the one who fought for him. Mo said they wanted, you know, some of his associates wanted to sack Prince. And he, Mo said, no, no, no. This kid is on to something. I think we should let him develop. Like back when they let you develop. You right. Know? Yeah. yeah. And, you know, so he, he got a stay of execution. And I think he decided like, okay, this, I got to really push now. Right. Uh, enough of doing what only what I'm accustomed to or what I prefer. I have to make a real statement now. Right. Okay. And I think that, you know, between, I mean, the next record was what controversy and then 1999, 1999 is really like the blueprint for the Minneapolis sound, or at least what they called it. Right. Yes. And he mostly recorded that record by himself. I guess I'm saying all this to say they bet on him and they won. By the time he's asking for an equitable deal, he has proven himself to be a success. Oh, for, yeah. You know, yeah. It's like, it's, it, yeah, it's like, we're not guessing anymore. He knows what he's doing. He's not an upstart and he's worth more to you For sure. than you could have imagined. Absolutely. So yeah. the fact that they were so reticent to even play around with it, because I guess you'd be setting a precedent for every other artist on your roster. If you give Prince a better deal, then Madonna's going to come right after him. Yeah. Is Mo in? Yeah. Okay. What about my deal? So I get it. Sometimes these things happen in, in the world where I can't give a little, because if I give a little, I'm lose, I'm, I might lose everything. And it's right. a sad place to be. And yeah. Prince understood the drama of it. And, but, uh, you know, just the fact that they were just so kind of like, uh-uh, no, they didn't want to talk about it. And it just added insult to injury, right. you know? Okay. And uh, so it, he wasn't just out there a raving lunatic for anybody who thought, I don't know what Prince was talking about. He was really fighting for recording artists' rights in perpetuity. Right. You know, he spent the rest of his career really trying to do things his own way, you know, and trying to tell young artists, don't just sign whatever they put in front of your your, your face. Right, yeah. Like, you know, you're young, you have, you, you have the world on a string. They want what you've got. Protect it. So, yeah, it's, I mean, which is, I mean, he became, a, you know, that's what happens to most of us. If we're lucky, we become statesmen, we become elders. We try to impart your knowledge on the young people. Yeah. Up. Yeah. Don't Help make the out. same mistakes I did. Pay yes. it forward even. Well, exactly. And so, I mean, I think we all feel, uh, you know, a lot of us feel that responsibility. I mean, a lot of ways I, I stayed on that gig downtown with Dr. Mambo's combo for over 30 years. Just, I mean, mainly to set an example and to be an example that existed in the city. Like these are the things you need to do. Yeah. If you, if you consider yourself a real musician, come down here and see what that's like. Is this really what you want? Hey, you know? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Cause there's, there's a shine on it that everybody sees that they don't see behind that. Yeah. Everybody thinks it's all parties and, you know, 
Uh, what uh, somebody said, sex, drugs, and limousine music. It's not that. <laughs> if you if you're in it for the right reason, you you were it's manual labor, especially if you're a drummer. Yeah. Ask, you know, ask Dave Perner. <laughs> yeah, and Dave Perner too. Yeah, and, uh, it's funny because some nights I see the pool of sweat, like <laughs> on the stage floor that has run out his sleeve, and you know, mainly when he plays acoustic. That's when it starts to well up on the ground. There's a little <laughs> pool of sweat that's trickled from his arm out and onto the floor. You know, it's uh, it, it's no joke. It's not. There's going to be a lot of hard times if you're going to play music for a living. Yeah. So you better love it. Exactly. It's been exactly. my main mantra is like, listen, if you're in it for the sex, drug and ro- drugs and rock and roll, it's the wrong reason. You know, and, and there ain't no money in it uh, unless you're unless you're writing great songs or you, you know, fall backwards into some situation. Yeah, yeah. But generally, you work. And I see these memes on Facebook sometimes about how come club owners still think that $100 is sufficient to pay a musician? If you're making 100 bucks, they think they're really doing something for you. Yeah. That was the standard back in 1970. Wow. And we're, it's 2024, and there's still club owners going... But hey, you know, I got 500 bucks for you guys, you know. Yeah. It, uh, and it's, you know, it's a five feast and everybody gets a hundred bucks. And it's like, I've been playing music for 40. <laughs> I'm 55. I'm trying to do this now. <laughs> I mean, since I was probably 15. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, if I was still out there jobbing, I just kind of decided, well, fortunately with Soul Asylum, I don't have to take any jobs I don't want. Yeah. But, True. but the fact that people are still out there making a hundred bucks a night to do this, it's really, we're being taken, they're being taken advantage of because yeah. the truth is any real musician would do it for free. But, but why should you? Exactly. Especially if, if the house is bringing in money. Right. Exactly. We, you know, I don't get a say in, in what liquor prices are, you know, how the, uh, how much you, you're charging for beer and so on and so forth. But I mean, I'm not even really trying to, I'm not tr- trying to stir up any a- a- acrimony. I'm just saying it is what it is. And it's, you know, it's unfortunate because if the same situation, if one club in this city starts paying everybody to 50, then the standard is going to change and everybody's going to be upset. Yep. So it's that thing, that device in, in society and in dealing with people and maybe even like just in dealing with money and greed, you know, Yeah. That, I think that's what it is. Uh, so, I mean, I don't know how I ended up in this, <laughs> like that, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, Prince was, and again, Prince, well, even with that, all, all that success, he never stopped grinding, man. Yeah. That's he true. grind day, he would grind day and night. It's, you know, he never took it for granted. Well, anyway, oh, me and Sonny, right. Yeah. Okay. What happened was no ceremony for Diamonds and Pearls. Nothing from the estate. Oh, no wow. special. And I'm like, okay, so it, it, it's our time to shine now. And finally, a record I played on is getting the treatment. Right. And nobody wants to do anything. So it, it, that upset me a little bit. And I decided at that moment, I'm like, I have to take better care of my legacy. I need to control the outcome, what the final word is, because I can you know, sweat my butt off for anybody in the yeah. world. That sweat equity is a real thing. It's manual labor. Oh, yeah. I got arthritis in one, in one elbow. My knees don't work so good all the time. And, you know, it's not all uh, occupational hazard. I'm a big boy. I, I, you know, for years I ate whatever I want, whenever I, whenever I felt like it. Right. You know, I know a little bit more about nutrition now and I'm on my way back down. Oh, but awesome. But it's it's hard. It's a hard thing to do. Oh, well, um, yeah. And then there are many days when I fail. When it's like, yeah, I wasn't going to eat that pizza. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, yeah. I'm I'm only human, exactly. and most of my discipline, most of my discipline has gone into my craft. So I'm I've been lax on a lot of things in life. I'm the, the I learned a lot about myself during the pandemic when there was nothing else to do but reflect. True. You know, so I'm on the road. I'm, I'm learning and I'm doing. As best I know how. But I called Sonny uh, and I said, Sonny, I got this song, man, that I wrote. And, uh, you know, I'd like to collaborate on it with you. And um, Sonny said, OK. And between that time and when this thing happened, 
where we just basically nothing happened, you know, no, no huge parties for us. No, yeah. you know, no performances, no nothing. I was like, Sonny, we can't leave it to other people to, you know, decide what we're going to do about our career. And it, we, I'd been kind of uh, reluctant to like pick up the mantle and like go for it. Cause it's like, I don't want to be, Framed in history as the guy who played drums for Prince only. Right, you know what right, I mean? Yeah. So I was like, okay, I'm not really going to push the lore. I'm not going to really involve myself in these other reunion oriented things. things. And yeah, I didn't really want to do that. And um, I, what it really came down to was we did have one experience. We after Prince passed. There was a huge show at the Excel Center here in Minneapolis and, and uh, St. Paul. Okay, and it was a, a a tremendous undertaking, you know, for everybody involved. And uh, I, you know, I just, I guess, by that time, I really knew who I was musically, and I and I had been musically directing with some different groups, and I had my own sort of standard and way of uh, that I like to do things. Okay, and in that situation, someone else was in charge. And and they did it the way they saw fit, and that's great. But it was wasn't my style, and I felt like a, a lot of things could have been done differently, more efficiently. And so I was like, no, I don't really. I think the time has come where I don't really need somebody telling me what to do. Right. I need to be in the position where I'm telling others what to do, because I know what I'm talking about. I I know music. I understand music. I know what everybody's playing all the time. And if you play the wrong note, I can tell you which one it is. I got perfect pitch. Exactly. <laughs> so I, I just decided that nah, I'm, I'm, if I'm going to do it, it's going to be under the, con the condition that I'm my own man, that I'm running the show. And uh, so I had a brief discussion with somebody at the estate about that. And they didn't really, it seems like they weren't really planning on doing much of anything anyway. And that's what happened. We kind of just got left in the dust. Oh, the nineties, you know, the revolution gets a lot of accolades for, for their contribution to Prince's legacy. Right. But, you know, they kind of got on a rocket ship that was already headed to the moon. By the time we got with Prince, he was trying to figure things out again. And that's a different kind of task. Like when you've been in favor and you're out of favor, how do you regain your momentum and your place? Exactly. And might maybe even say it's more difficult. That's what I'm saying. So, I mean, uh, yeah, we had the Herculean task of bringing Prince back into popularity at a time when the music that was popular, he wasn't really into Prince was not a big fan of hip hop at the time. Uh -huh. He may have heard, heard something from here or there that he liked, you know, but I think he had been critical of rap music and all the stuff that had become sort of popular. So he was experimenting with, you know, okay, how do I find a voice? Yeah. In, the, in the middle of all this, all, all this other, you know, this noise. And what he actually ended up doing was kind of a combination of going forward and going backward. Cause our band was like, we were kind of like James Brown's band, like tight, funky, efficient, like it was like a real show band, you know, like really tight. So it's kind of, the, he took that kind of old school sort of aesthetic but we also had like Tony, Tony M, you know, there was a, a rapper in the band and Prince figured out a formula where he could use one of the greatest singers who ever lived, Rosie Gaines and Tony M, who was just coming, become, coming on the scene as a rapper. Mm -hmm. Like he had familiar elements with unfamiliar elements, or he figured out a formula that made that music work. And really, I mean, I guess in a, in a sense, you could say he kind of went back to his roots, but he also listened to a lot of music you know, that was happening at that time. Like he was like, yeah. I have to be informed. Even if I don't like what's going on, I should know what's going on. Right. And maybe yeah. I can figure out a way to do the same thing without, you know, in a way that suits me. Yeah. You know, his own. So the, that's really what it was. It was like, he kind of, it, he went from kind of, uh, cause I think is uh, some people argue that, towards the end of the eighties that Prince is like, he's just not funky anymore. He's not really a funk artist. He's a, you know, and that's why he made the black album was because he was getting all this static, you know, all these people talking about, oh, I'm not funky no more. Yeah. He made the black album, but you know, I mean, it was ill and with, with the wrong intention. Like he was yeah. going to try to prove something to somebody. And it's like, you're Prince. You don't have to prove anything to anybody. Yeah, that's true.
you know, but he felt some kind of pressure, you know, and then came Sign of the Times, which he wanted to be a three album set oh, wow. uh, called Crystal Ball. But that he he released a, a kind of anthology of like outtakes and uh, B sides on uh, on a package called Crystal Ball later. Um, OK. In the 90s. But uh, OK, well, let me get back to it. Let's see. <laughs> Where was I? Yes. So I tell Sonny, like, you know. Nobody ever, these award shows go on. Nobody ever calls us. Nobody ever asks us to participate. And meanwhile, you know, we see everybody else sopping up that good juice. I'm like, okay. When I, so when I heard that Diamonds and Pearls was going to get the treatment, like now, now everybody will see. Yeah. You know, and you know, they kind of let it out. I mean, the, the big surprise was the DVD, which is an early gig from the Glam Slam, uh, the club in Minneapolis. Right, like right. Yeah. The band had only played a few shows. Oh, wow. So, and that's how good we were then. By the time we went on tour, like in the summer, it was, I mean, it was a, a whole other beast. It was, you know. Yeah. And we had a glimpse of that on the nude tour because Rosie had joined the band then. But Prince hadn't figured out exactly what to do with her yet. We recorded a lot of music with her. And, uh, you know, there were plans for a solo record. But I think, honestly, I think that Prince he wanted the very best for her, but he didn't want to let her go. She's, she's in, incredible. Rosie Gaines is maybe my favorite singer of all time. Oh, wow. And if you watch that DVD, you'll see why. I mean, it was just, uh, it, she's, <laughs> she's just, she's just incredible. Yeah. Uh, anyway. So I'm like, okay, uh, good thing the DVD came out. Cause otherwise nobody would ever really know how good this band really was, you know? And I, you know, I, I got, kind of provoked by the whole situation. Like I kind of got upset and I, and that's what led me to the conversation with Sonny. Like, Hey, listen, we're already known as a duo. Anybody who comes to talk to me about anything asks about Sonny. Right. And he has, you know, the same experience, you know, wherever he goes, people, Hey man, where, 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 where's Michael at? They expect us to be together. Right. And, and so that combined with Pierre Lewis saying the thing about, I think you two came down from the same pod, you know, <laughs> I was like, it's really like that. Like we're, we're, we're different. Sonny has perfect pitch too. Sonny oh, also God. plays bass left-handed. I play some, some bass and some keys. So we have all these kinship, you know, these things uh, in common, but we're kind of a couple of two weirdos. We're kind of, a, you know, <laughs> So that's why it's brothers, but it's kind of others. Like right. we don't really belong anywhere else. I don't know where we came from exactly <laughs> or how this happened. But I mean, like, really, it's like, it's a very, it's a bizarre thing. I, when I play with Sonny, it's, uh, it, it's a sound that I can't, that you can't, it can't happen any other way. Right. It's just me and him. A thing happens. We passed the test of time. It's true. Sometimes we disagree Whenever there's a problem We can work it out Ain't no need to shout Don't you ever doubt You're my brother You're my brother Count on me And I'll count on you That's why Prince also liked playing with us as a trio because, you know, he wouldn't have to talk about the key or the tempo or anything. He just start playing. Yeah. And we jump in. Sonny's got perfect pitch. So whatever key son Prince is playing it. Yeah. All right. And we just jump in and we're on for the ride. And, you know, um, there's some footage in a, in a DVD called the sacrifice of Victor of us playing as a trio. And it's like, it really, you can, it's a different energy. Like Prince, I know that he felt completely free. And I think one of the only reasons he didn't really push the new power trio as a real thing was that I, I, <laughs> I really think he didn't want to share the spotlight like that. I can see that. I, you know, I, can see I, that. I mean, and again, it's like, yeah, I understand, man. I mean, he was an eccentric person, but he was also human. He had feelings and he had worked for something. And so it's like, but I mean, it's, I always found that a, a little comical more than anything else. I'm like, 
somebody told me, somebody in the band, I'm not going to name his name, said, he mentioned, we were on the phone, he was like, hey man, remember when we started the new tour and you had a drum solo and it got taken out after about six shows? <laughs> I said, I don't really remember because I'm probably I was probably happy to get out from under because I hate taking drum solos. Oh, yeah. He said, man, he said, I was talking to Prince and Prince said, how come they don't cheer for me like that when I take a guitar solo? (laughs) And uh, and he said, Prince, you do everything. You do all things so well. Nobody thinks of you that way. Like you, you're a great singer, dancer, writer, musician, like you do it all, you know? So it's, it, it's not as evident to people how great a guitar player you are, but it like, he really like, it, he took the drum solo out the show. <laughs> <laughs> because he was, he was jealous of, about how hard the crowd was cheering. Oh, wow. So, that's you know, insane. and that's fine. Everybody's got an ego. And, you know, I'm sure I've been my lesser self on many an occasion. I know I, I have. I just thought it was funny. I'm like, you're in, you're in competition with somebody who is at your employ. Yeah. You know, <laughs> how are you? Why? You know, and he had a similar moment with this particular individual yeah. saying, like, I play, be- I play such and such better than you. And the dude was like, Prince, of course you do. Yeah. You're Prince. Yeah. Why, why are we fighting about this? I, you're great. I'm telling you, you're great. Yeah. Like, why do you care? Why are you comparing yourself to me? I work for you. Exactly. I agree with you, boss. <laughs> yes. So it's just weird, you know, uh, again, it's just, uh, you know, but so I really think that I mean, we almost played the house of blues on sunset oh. back in 1993. Like we flew out to LA. We didn't like, it was a secret. Like I think Sonny and I even bought our own tickets. Like he didn't want it even showing up on the payroll. Yeah. We went out to LA. We ended up shooting a video for a song called Peach at SIR mm-hmm. that night. But like the next day we were supposed to play and he decided he didn't want to do it. I, he never said why. He just like, uh, uh, yeah, let's not. Wow. So we just flew back. Oh my we God. Just flew, flew home. Yeah. We just but, flew uh, out for a day, just hang out. Well, I mean, we got, we, we rehearsed and, and we video. got a video out of yeah, it. It's true. You know, so, but, uh, you know, it was like, <laughs> we were like, and so, Sonny and I were like, we're about to be like Mitch Mitchell and Noel Reddy. <laughs> <laughs> like, we're good. That's going to be our place in history now. Yeah. So we were like, you know, we were juiced up for it. Like, yep. oh, great. Here we go, man. We, we're about to wreck everything. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <and> then, <laughs> nah, I don't feel like doing it. Yeah, I, no, uh, I, I decided not to. Uh, I'll, I'll see you guys. I'll see you guys at rehearsal on Monday. Yeah. You know? Oh my! So brothers, That's it. brothers, brothers. I've, yes, I've so brothers. To it a bunch. Uh, you know, Ryan sent okay. me a link to it, and I've been able to hear it a few times. And okay, and it's so cool. The first thing that comes to my mind is it's kind of like it's got like the vibe, like like Bill Withers' "Lean on Me," but happier. Yes, there is it. that. I hadn't thought about that angle. I was thinking about like when I, when I was putting it together, I was, uh, I was first off, I, I love Sonny Thompson. He's really the closest thing I have to a brother in this world. Yeah. Like really we've gone. Uh, and then the song is autobiographical, <laughs> you I, know? Yeah, yeah. Just listen to it. It uh, definitely and sounds it. And what's funny is I played it. We played it for Dave Perna the other night at solo side rehearsal. And you know, Dave's a pretty harsh critic about songs. Okay. So I expected him to like, uh, hey man, uh, no, no, you shouldn't have done that. Just you know, I expected him to just kind of start criticizing it, right. and I, I got a, I got thick skin. I, I, it's cool, yeah, you know. Uh, so I was, I didn't know how he was going to take it, and by the second chorus, he just started laughing. I'm like, <laughs> I got you, man. You understand what I'm doing? He says, he says this is a theme song. Yeah, and I said, yeah, you're right. It's a theme song. He's oh, like, that's that. a theme song. That's you, because the song is called Brother and the act is called Brothers. It's a theme song. Yeah. And and he was like, it, you should do a show, like a sitcom. Like, it's like kind of like 80s sitcom music. Oh, my gosh. Like the Wayans Brothers. We're brothers. Doo-doo-doo-doo. Yes, it's Doo-doo-doo. like that. Or um, people let me tell you about my best friend. Yeah. He's, he's a it's kind of it's got a little Nielsen to yes, it. Yes, it does. Like, and. Yeah, a little War, a little Nielsen, a little Beatles, like a little like Maxwell Sil- uh, Silver Hammer. Like there's, uh, you know, yeah. it's kind of in that realm. And, you know, I thought to myself at first, like people are going to expect us to come with like the heavy funk. 
yeah. but I don't want that right away. I need something they can grasp. This is something awesome. that's going to bring some light into the world somehow. Cause yeah, well, I don't need to tell you wherever you're at, you, we're all catching hell. Yeah. You know, yep. and life is just socking everybody in the gut. <sighs> so yeah. it's like, I just like, I need to say something positive and something simple enough that everybody can get it. Well, are, are there plans for more songs from you guys? Is it just this one well, for an hour? I'll be 100% candid with you about this. <laughs> okay. I, I literally, I heard about high tension records from like a post that Ryan Smith did on like Facebook or something. And I think I called him. I said, you're just going to be hiring all your, you know, all your dirty friends with their, you know, <laughs> it's just going to be like alt rock. Right. Like what is it? I said, I, I like, are you just going to be signing these, you know, these dirty alternative, uh, alternative bands around these, these emo bands, these, uh, uh, I can't even, what do they call them even now? I can't, I, I can't No. Yeah. But just, you know, that the shoegazers and whatnot, I said, is that all you guys are going to be doing? He said, no, I, no. He's like, it's going to be very pro Minnesota, you know, pro Minneapolis. I'm like, I said, you sign me. <laughs> he said, well, send me some music, you know, <laughs> I didn't know, I, you know, I was, cause I, I had been toying with the idea of releasing some music on my own anyway. Okay. I had been writing and co-writing a lot over the last few years. Okay. So I said, okay, let me send you a couple things I got. He said, Whoa, this is really cool. This and that, you know, and I saved brother for last. I sent him probably three songs. I'm like, here's this other thing I'm toying with. It's probably going to be a duet with Sonny. Uh, is great. I love it. You know? And, um, awesome. So, I, you know, and then I went from like, no, I don't really want it to be a, a, a like a solo album. I don't want to present like that. Right. I need a teammate. And Sonny was the, is the most obvious choice. Oh yeah. We're, we're, we're teammates anyway. So, I just said it's the act is called brothers and it's going to be me and Sonny. And this is going to be the song. And Ryan and I, we haven't even talked about like, like record stuff, like no contract signed. Right. No, you know, I don't know what the percentage is. You know, I know he managed to get Mark Mullman's, you know, song out. All right. Yes. And, uh, and, and you know, it's like, I'm not looking to be greedy. I'm sure if they came to a, a an amicable, agreement i certainly can and and more moreover i'm bigger than smith i see him two times a week and so if he if he pulls anything funny i'll clobber him that's right so, so i'm not worried about getting a fair deal from high tension records because <laughs> i'll just do this right. from the drums <laughs> hey listen smith you want a mouthful right you know you better fix those percentages you know <laughs> Not really. I, I love Ryan Smith with all my heart. Yeah. But I, oh, he's a I delight. I delight in, in like getting aggressive with him because he just <laughs> he, like he just look at it looks like that. We all kind of shove him around because he's a good sport, you know. But he's just the nicest guy you'll ever want to be. Oh, he's such a and sweetheart. Just, yeah. Uh, me and Dave, we just trash him. Yeah. Just <laughs> constantly, you know. Because uh, 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 first off, because he knows we don't mean it. Exactly. You know? Exactly. It's, it's all it's part of being kind of, a fan. Exactly. It's like we just take the nicest guy and then just rub him raw. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You got you to haze him a little bit. So, yeah. So, I mean, that's the long and short of it. And I figured since I was going to, I had a song I wanted to come out and I, and we kind of missed the opportunity of having any sort of NPG original NPG reunion. Let's couple the two. Let's have an event. You know? Okay. And it started out as being a whole different idea I had for me and Sonny and Barbarella and a DJ. I was going to do a different sort of thing with a guitar player named Corey Wong. I don't know if you know who that is. Yes. Yes. That dude's amazing. Yes. We were going to do it with Corey, but Corey is going to be in Belgium or somewhere. He's doing something with the Metropole Orchestra. Oh, wow. So he couldn't do it. So, you know, I'm like, okay, well, the gig's booked and it's at the Uptown Theater <laughs> and it's the capacity is 1750. I'm like, I better pull off a spectacle. Yeah. So that's when I had to really get in gear. It's like, it's not just about me and Sonny, but it's also about, it's a little celebration, celebrating Prince's life and his music. And it's on 420, which is actually the day before the anniversary of his passing. Okay. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it's kind of all, I'm stacking it all up. And, you know, and, and Prince was very, you know, we had moments where we really, 
uh, was sort of transparent and more brotherly with us when it was just us. Cause you take away all the rest of it. It's like, if you're talking about music, like we really all kind of vibrated the sort of same way, mm-hmm. like Prince really, I really, really respected Sonny as a musician, just like me. Yeah. Yeah. So Sonny was kind of the, the, the link between us. I, I like to think that Prince and I revered Sonny in a certain kind of way. Yeah. And that's what the chemistry really is. Sonny was, is the bridge. Prince knew him. I think Prince was 13 when he met Sonny and Sonny was like 15 and they were like riding the, like the Metro transit, like the bus. And Sonny said, I saw this little dude get on, on the bus you know, with Afro and he was carrying a guitar case and he sat, you know, I was, he said, I had mine with me too. He said, you know, so Prince kind of sat not super close, but you know, close enough, you know, that they could have a conversation. And right. then he moved over. Closer. Like, well, Hey man, open, you know, open your case. What are you playing? Yeah. You know? And that's just Sonny's nature. Sonny is, he's a musician's musician. He's always, he's a wellspring of knowledge and information and so supportive of other musicians. Oh, that's awesome. You know, like he'll share knowledge with anybody. It doesn't matter what level of player you are. Sonny Thompson is always, you can do it. Sonny is, he's such, uh, I mean, I don't have that. <laughs> I, you know, I, my, my musical discipline is a product of negative reinforcement. Oh, like, wow. Yeah. People, I got the crap kicked out of me musically <laughs> is what made me perform. Wow. Like, yeah, like I, the first time I met the original bass player for Dr. Mambo's Combo, I sat in at this at this club and he was there and we both got up to sit in at the same time and he was taking a, a bass solo and I'm back there, you know, kind of doing my thing, like, you know, thinking I'm doing the right thing. He stops playing and in, in one movement, he stops playing and he turns around and he he's putting his cigarette out on the on the head of the amp and he says, hey. You want to play some effing time back there? <laughs> and, wow. You know, I'm 16. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> you know, and then, you know, I mean, I played with my dad in church and if I got too fancy in, in, at church, what are you doing? Bro? Play, give me some time. Don't yeah. be, don't worry about all that. Here, give me, give me the beat. Right. <laughs> you know, and, and Floyd Thompson was also kind of, kind of a crusty teacher. Yeah. So I had been hollered into greatness. Yeah. You know, I've been, <laughs> You know, they cooked me, right. you know, <laughs> so that's how I got mine. So I'm not really in a position to teach others because of the, of the process. Right. I'm very direct when it comes to working in music. Like I don't really have a, a great bedside manner. Okay. Like I don't really care uh, so much about your feelings because I'm focused on the music. Right. I want the music to work. And okay. if you're not willing to put the music before yourself. We don't have any business working with each other. Okay. And so, you know, unfor- well, for what it's worth. So I'm known uh, all throughout the whole Metro as this kind of, you know, this kind of crusty dude, <laughs> like, you know, who <laughs> kind of says what's on his mind. And like, if you're not giving it up, I'm going to say it. Right. You know, but that's how seriously I take music, but under the right circumstances, I can be encouraging, you know, and I've learned to, it kind of smooth the edges a little yeah. bit. I can be diplomatic because I also realize that if you have to yell at a person to communicate, you're not doing it the right way. Right. My best bet was just to sort of stay out. Okay. You know, I don't teach. I might start, I might put a series up on like Patreon or something. Oh, you know, cool. I've been thinking about it. Like a little drum instructional, you know, and just get a little income coming in. A little mailbox uh, but, money. Yeah. But I mean, Sonny is the exact opposite. Sonny will talk to anybody. He will. I mean, but I have seen him (laughs) on the gig. have like a guitar player will come up and sit him with the combo. And I mean, actually, Sonny didn't start this tradition. But the guy who yelled at me when I was 16. Yeah. He's the guy who started the tradition. His name is Doug Nelson. Incredible bass player. Okay. Incredible. He somebody was sitting in and they were just messing up. And Doug just kind of, he didn't even stop playing. He just, he walked over and he pulled the dude's cord out of the amp. <laughs> so you're done, man. Get the, get the, you know, those are the cats I rolled with. So I'm not in a position to take a tender young mind. Right. And that's not me. 
If you want it rough, I'll give it to you. Right. But I, I, I don't have that. Oh, you're doing so well. Why don't, hey, and, why don't and, you try this approach instead? Yeah. As hard as I am on other people, I'm twice as hard on myself. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I'm saying it just, I, I'm not everybody's taste. I realize <laughs> I've made enemies in this town, but I've been true to myself. And I guess that's what I, you know, it's like, it, also people know if they want somebody to be honest, they'll come to me. No. Because I'm not lone, known for blowing smoke. I'm not known for, uh, you know, um, kind of, you know, half-baked language. I, if you really, as, but so now that I have this reputation, some people who, you know, really want to know, they'll come. But definitely others who don't want to know, they don't come around at all. Just avoid. So it's, yeah. it's better for both of us. Yeah. So, <laughs> but, wow. so I guess that's what it's, what it's all about. I wanted to play with my old, with Levi's, come, Levi Caesar. Levi is one of the people who helped Prince choose the band. Like Levi was the musical director for oh, New Power man. Generation. Oh, and, man. you know, Prince was like, what do you think? And Levi was said, he, he told Prince, he said, I didn't know there was any drummers in this town that were that good. Wow. You know, and which was, I mean, for me being, I was what, 18 at the time? Yeah. Yeah. God. 17 or 18. That's yeah. And so I, Levi, Barbarella, Sonny, and I will be the rhythm section for this event. We're going to play Brother. Probably, we'll probably open the show with it. And, uh, you know, uh, some people who also appeared in the DVD from the Diamonds and Pearls collection, the Steel Singers, the Steels are going to be with us. Oh, cool. Uh, a really great artist named Chastity Brown. Uh, who okay. moved to the Twin Cities? Oh, oh, I don't know how many years ago now. She's great. Uh, who else? Ash Smash. Ash sings with Stokely's band. Stokely had a band called Mint Condition, and from Minneapolis. So she works with him, and she also. Uh, I we encounter each other in different configurations around the city. Yeah. Uh, G Sharp, uh, who's my, one of my oldest friends, <laughs> uh, who moved to Minneapolis. He moved to Minneapolis to be the lead singer of Maserati when Sir Terry, Terry Casey quit. And, okay. but the album got shelved and nothing else happened with Maserati really. But then he ended up joining the combo, the uh, Dr. Mambo's combo. Oh, okay. Okay. So I've been looking at G for forever. So <laughs> I like to call him the, the mayor of our fair city. G sharp, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. He's uh, you know, we're, we're like brothers too, you know, awesome. but um, all these cats are coming. And JB, JB from JB and the Routine. JB's got a band. He started with Jelly Bean. You know, Jelly Bean plays guitar, right? No, no. Jelly Bean Johnson. Jelly Bean Johnson. Jelly Bean Johnson is a great guitar player, man. I'll, I'll, all right, I'm writing that down. Okay. And uh, not only that, uh, if you go back to some of like the early productions of Jam and Lewis, mm -hmm. Jelly Bean's playing guitar on all that. Okay. Oh. Not only that, Jelly, Jelly played the main guitar part on black cat, I think by Janet Jackson. Oh, really? Oh, wow. Yeah. There's a couple other cats on that track. I think the solo was Dave Barry, oh, uh, wow. but okay. uh, beans playing guitar on black cat. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, like, so yeah, no, he's a, like actually Prince didn't really know. And he came down to bunkers one night and jelly bean was playing guitar while he was sitting in. And the next time I saw Prince, he was like, he said, Jelly can play a little guitar, huh? <laughs> he can play, Jelly can play a little bit. And that's high praise coming from Prince. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like for him to even acknowledge, it was like, yeah. Yeah, Jelly can play a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I was like, yeah, Jelly, Jelly's bad, man. Oh, man, that is awesome. <laughs> so it's a it's a bit of, it's a, I mean, it's a social event, you know, of uh, uh, on many different levels. But mainly, I, I want to play with the cats who I came up with. And the fans kind of got robbed out of any sort of real reunion between us. And also because I've just kind of said no to every other offer that came in because I want to be the master of what I survey. I need to keep the standard that I have in, in mind. Right. Yeah. I, things have to operate at a certain level. And I only trust myself to do that. That's, that's understandable. It's, it's, it's yeah, it's it, the preparation has been difficult. I'm not used to being like the man in charge and setting people's money and whatnot, like holding the bag, holding the purse. Right. This is new for me. Yeah. So I'm, you know, I'm kind of biting my nails looking at the, how, how many tickets we sell, you know, and thinking about, you know, the, the plane tickets and the hotels. And oh. It's a, it's an interesting position to be in when you're the man. It's a, it's a lot of headaches, man. Yeah. But I've I've got to do this, you well, know. What is the best way for people to find the album when it comes out, or the, the single when it comes out, and, and keep track of what you're up to? Well, you know what? That's I mean, there's Brothers Music 
2024 is my the Instagram handle. Okay. Also uh, on Facebook, it's Brothers for Life. Is and that four uh, spelled out or the number four? It's like because on Facebook you can't you got to give them like a first name and a last name. And uh, I tried every way to get around it. It's Brothers and then it's uh, for Life. Okay. Like Brothers. Like if my name was hey my name is Brothers for Life. Right. F O R L I F. All right. Okay. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, I think I, Smith is on me to create a Twitter account or whatever they call it now. Oh yeah, but I haven't done it yet. <laughs> but um, or you could go to High Tension Records. I'm sure they got. Just look them up. Everything yeah. that we're in, it, everything that we're doing, they're a part of it. Well, I've man. been looking at like T-shirt oh. graphics. Like Smith is. T- sh- hey, we're gonna make socks. Like there's some, <laughs> a pair of socks. It's got my avatar on one and Sunny on it. Like I'm on the right sock. Sunny's on the left that sock. That is awesome. <laughs> That's very cute, the whole thing. And we've got a video that we're also releasing. And I've been dropping little clips from it as the video director has been churning them out. Uh, and his name is Jason East, and he's a genius. I was, this guy was, I mean, I was so fortunate to find him. He's like, he does like live action video. Like, if you see any of the clips, this guy is creating all this in his little studio in his house. The dude is a genius. We had one conversation and he used almost every idea I gave him. Oh, and he no. added a few more. Like there's supposed to be the scene where the spaceship lands on Earth and it converts into a, a, a like a stage. But it's on like a, a farm. And like I, I, what I told him, I said, I want me and Sonny to be able to like look at cows and sheep and stuff and have them turn into like 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 laser beams, like turn them into like a crowd, like a crowd of people. Like in it, like near like haystacks and right. whatnot. <laughs> so he's working on that scene now. I'm oh, like, I, I can't wait to see it. That is awesome. But uh, but that's the gist of it. I don't know how many more songs we want to put out. You know, with high tension. This is kind of an experiment and and a uh, and an act of faith, really and truly. Yeah. Like I, you know, I, I just it's just time to do things, man. I it's time to. I've talked about doing many things in, in my life, and I'm I'm 55 now, and I'm realizing. How many more years do you have to do these things? You yeah. know, it's time to start moving and being the author of your own story. I have had so much fun chatting with you. It's been all right, a man. Blast, man. I've, you, you, it's been enlightening for sure. So, OK, <laughs> I want I wanted to thank you so much for, for being an, old, an open book, man. This has been great. I really do appreciate everything. You, all the stories all the time. It's, it's, it's been a blast. Uh, well, I, hey, man, I'm I'm happy to do it, and thank you for offer, uh, for offering. Also, my pleasure, um, my pleasure. You know, and you know, Smith, Smith Smith's my dude, man. So, I, you know, if he said you're cool, I figured you were cool, and you're cool. Yeah, and you see the best.